Chapter 11. Wait, don't we know any way to defuse the barrier? Maybe we can force one of the dark wizards to do it. Ichigo suggested. That's brilliant. That one wizard who was capable of breaking the seal on Lullaby would surely be able to dispel Aragorn's wind barrier. Urza said happily. Only problem is that he and some other guy went after Natsu and Grey. Ichigo commented. Well he didn't come after me. Grey trailed off as he entered the room. Grey? Why are you here? Where is Natsu? Urza questioned evenly. I'm here because I got one of the Eisenwald goons to tell me their plans. They want to use lullaby on. Grey began, only to be cut off. The Guild Masters Conference, right? Ichigo and Urza said in unison. Yeah, anyway, even if we know that it doesn't change the fact that we fell for their trap. Still if what you said is true, all we have to do is find that Kagiyama guy, and we can make him dispel the wind barrier. Grey mused. Then we need to find those two as soon as possible. Ichigo stated. Urza nodded in agreement, after which the trio ran off to find the dimwitted dragon slayer, who beyond a shadow of a doubt had no idea what was going on. They just prayed he didn't go overboard and wind up knocking out Kagiyama, otherwise they'd be in some serious trouble. Come on Natsu, I've got faith in you. Ichigo thought, mimicking those of Urza and, to a lesser extent, Grey. Oshibana Station, with Natsu. Eragor. Natsu shouted as he pounded through door after door. Any room within his sight the dragon slayer would walk up to and use his flame-covered fist to blow the entrance, and a good portion of the surrounding walls, to smithereens. He hadn't had any luck as of yet, but that didn't deter him in the slightest. If anything, it only encouraged his rampant tirade of destruction. Eragor, come out come out wherever you are. Natsu exclaimed, decimating yet another doorway, and the brick that surrounded it. TCH, doesn't this guy know how to use a door? Cage wondered aloud as he followed the dim-witted fairy tale wizard from the shadows. He seeped back into the floor of the station, after which he began to silently follow the fire wizard once more. All he needed was a single opportunity to strike and the fight would be over. In fact, by his standpoint, their confrontation was over before it even began. Now that Aragorn's made it out safely this kid doesn't pose much of a threat, at least not to anything that isn't a door. Cage thought, observing as the pink-haired wizard smashed through half of the hallway he had just rounded. Show yourself, Aragor. Natsu roared. I could just let him go, but what would be the fun in that? Cage wondered, surfacing from the floor directly behind the fairy tale wizard. Natsu turned, instantly sensing that an attack was coming, but he was far too late. Around four of the shadowy tendrils took the form of fists and pounded into his body without delay. He himself shot backwards into a large amount of wooden crates, but he'd taken worse hits. There, I've wanted to do that for a while now. Had enough fairy tale insect. Cage taunted as his opponent struggled to free himself of the surrounding debris. Not you again. Natsu exclaimed, coming up from the crate's remnants with his head having gone through a painting. Wow, you look like an idiot. Cage commented, smirking at how truly idiotic the pink-haired teen looked. Or shut it, doggy. Natsu said, causing a tick mark to appear on the raven-haired wizard's forehead. It's Cage. Not Doggy, Cage. He exclaimed. Same thing really. Natsu muttered underneath his breath. I think I've got you figured out. You eat fire to increase your power, and now that I know that, it shouldn't be too hard to stamp out. Cage stated contentedly. Whatever, just tell me where Aragor is. Natsu demanded. TCH, you'll have to beat it out of me. Fairy tale insect. Cage scoffed. My pleasure. Natsu said with a bloodthirsty grin. Oshibana Station, Central Chambers. The remnants of the Eisenwald Guild currently either sat in place with ropes surrounding their bodies, courtesy of a very agitated red headed teen, or lay on the ground, unconscious, and unable to truly do anything at the moment. However, one remained conscious despite having taken a very large hit from the Fairy Queen, though he still was incapable of moving. How long are you going sit there hiding Karaka? Bayad asked in a low voice, his wounds not allowing him to speak any louder. I'm sorry, but I was scared. Karaka stated, phasing his upper body out of the wall he currently sat within. Never mind that now, the wind barrier is up, and now we need to make sure that they don't escape. To do that, you need to find Kagiyama before they figure out he can dispel the barrier. Bayad stated. No, please don't make me. You know I'm no good in a fight Bayad. Karaka pleaded, obviously fearing that he would be caught by the enemy. Calm. 
Down. I'm sure even you can handle this. Byatt said confidently, only eliciting quiet groaning from the green-haired phase magic user. Oshibana Station, with Ichigo, Urza, and Grey. Grey, are you sure this is near the place where Natsu and you separated? Ichigo asked, turning to the ice mage as the group continued to run down the halls. Positive. Though I don't know where the fire-breathing Morin wound up after we split. For all I know he blew up every wall he could find and tried to look for Eragor that way. Grey commented. That does sound like something he'd do. Ichigo thought. The group rounded the next hallway, after which they began to see a vast majority of doors and walls completely destroyed. Incidentally the aspect that made it a practical footprint for Natsu was the fact that the debris and the shattered stones were covered with ashes, likely due to a fire-based attack having been used to initially destroy the doors. We must be getting close. Urz amused. A moment later a loud resounding boom sounded off from several hallways down, which only caused each and every one of them to speed up more so. It sounded as if Natsu just went overboard, which he almost always did, but in this case it was the perfectly wrong thing to do. Upon running down to the end of the next hallway, they saw the dragon slayer standing directly in front of Cage, the very man they wanted to find. Currently, he appeared alive, but it had also seemed that Natsu had oh so stealthily punched him through a wall. I've really got to talk to him about not blowing things up all the time. Ichigo mentally noted. Property damage was definitely one of Natsu's strong points, however that may very well have been more of a detriment than a useful skill. Natsu, do not harm him, we need him alive. Urza exclaimed as she and the other ran up the staircase. Why to go, why a fire freak? Grey commented sarcastically, taking note that the dark wizard looked worse for wear. What? Natsu uttered, turning to face the group. The dragon slayer paled as he saw his scarlet-haired comrade raise a magical sword high in the air, having it pulled back and making to swing it directly at him. He began to sweat bullets, mostly because he didn't even know why this was happening. I don't know what I did wrong, but I'm sorry. Natsu said, holding his hands up defensively, as the queen of the fairies continued to move closer and closer towards him. Natsu released a quiet, but fearful squeak upon hearing the sword cut into the stone wall behind him, indicating that he, for the moment, hadn't invoked Titania's wrath. All the same, he still feared for his life at the mere implication that Urza was enraged with him. Urza, what the hell? Ichigo exclaimed, noticing that the magical sword was mere centimeters away from cutting into the ceiling wizard's shoulder. His words, however, didn't seem to register with the very person he had addressed. You will dispel the wind barrier, and you will do so without complaint. Urza demanded, a dark shade covering her face, as she glared at the dark mage. Cage, to his credit, managed not to say a word. He did, however, sweat bullets and shook slightly at the look the scarlet-haired woman was directing at him. Ichigo, from his perspective, was starting to see exactly why people were so afraid of this one woman. Just do it man, this chick's a real monster. Natsu said, still shaking from his previous thoughts that he was going to be brutally maimed by the red-headed knight. Shut up Natsu. Grey barked. Am I understood? Urza asked sternly, still holding her magical weapon within an inch of slicing into the Eisenwald wizard. F fine, I'll dispel it. Cage replied fearfully. Ichigo and the others shared an internal sigh of relief, mostly because of the fact that this meant they were virtually in the clear, or at least damn near close to it. An instant later, and much to their dismay, that sense of relief vanished. Each watched as a hand pierced through Cage's body, sprouting forth from a magical seal located on his stomach. It was clearly not doing any visible damage, but it very likely did significant amounts thereof to the wizard's internal organs. The amount of pain had to be substantial, as evident by the loud cry that the raven-haired man gave out upon this occurring. Cage groaned before falling over, revealing the thickly built Eisenwald mage that had ran away upon Ichigo and Urza defeating his comrades so easily. Karaka, why? Cage uttered before his eyes shut and his body finally hit the floor. Cage. Urza shouted, realizing that if this man died their chances of escaping effectively dropped to about zero. The green-haired wizard that had perpetrated the attack just stammered and released quiet short gasps in rapid succession, almost as if he couldn't really grasp the gravity of what he had just done. Nevertheless, he was still rendered immobile, and that allowed him to learn just how pissed. Off he had made several different people. You? Ichigo growled out. Without giving it a second thought, the orange-haired teen grabbed the stout man's collar and pulled him out of the wall, which said wizard didn't even seem to register for a moment. Immediately thereafter, 
Ichigo slammed the man's body into the very same wall so hard that it left an imprint. And even despite the nature of the mage's magical powers, he appeared to be too shocked to negate the blow by phasing through the stone. Even if you're in a dark guild, that man is still your comrade. Does that mean nothing to you? Why would you try to kill someone who you should think of as a friend? Ichigo roared, glaring and scowling extremely heavily at the green-haired man. Ah ah. Karaka moaned out, simply being too shocked to form a coherent sentence. No answer. Thought not, piece of trash. Ichigo scoffed, after which he simply dropped the man flat on his rear. Karaka almost immediately retreated back into the stone wall from whence he came, but a certain pink-haired dragon slayer wasn't about to let the scum get away with taking down his comrade. Oh no you don't. Natsu growled out, veins popping out on his forehead. His fists lit up a moment later, after which he absolutely and utterly destroyed the wall that was placed in front of them. Subsequently thereafter the body of the green-haired phase magic user slammed into the floor of the following room, landing with a loud boom. Is that how you dark guild members treat each other? Natsu exclaimed, shortly after which he punched Karaka through the wall opposite of his current position. Cage, can you hear me? Urza questioned. I think we are losing him Urza. Gray stated, checking the body for signs of life. We can't lose him. We need him to dispel the wind barrier. Urza shouted. He's unconscious, it's no use. Gray replied. We have to try. Urza said. The scarlet-haired mage then began to shake Cage's body, slamming his head into the floor repeatedly in the process. Gray watched her actions palely out with a sweat drop while Ichigo just released a tired sigh. If you want him to wake up, don't keep banging his head against the floor. Also I doubt he could even use magic in that condition. Ichigo stated evenly. He will if I force him to. Urza replied, still shaking the dark wizard's body. Um, did we miss something? Lucy wondered aloud as she and the blue third exceed entered via the large hole that Natsu had sent Cage through during their battle. I. Happy said confusedly. Some time later. I see, so we are basically stuck here. Lucy asked, eliciting a nod from several within the group. But we have to stop Eragor from reaching the guild masters. Natsu exclaimed angrily. I know that Natsu. Calm down. Urza chided, causing the pink-haired mage to pale. I think we all need to calm down, is there anything any of you can think of that we can do to get out of this mess? Ichigo asked calmly. I don't know. The wind barrier is too powerful for any of us to bully through, and our one hope of dispelling it is currently unconscious. Urza replied, sounding slightly worried. Hang on, let me try something. Ichigo stated. The entirety of those present watched as the orange-haired teen pulled his sword off of his back and prepared to stab it directly into the wind barrier. This, in turn, confused many given that it wasn't all too likely that an ordinary sword was going to have a shot at breaking through, but even so it was worth a try. Ichigo stabbed his Zampakuto directly into the flowing current of wind, actually managing to keep his sword steady if he used all of his strength to do so. No matter how hard he tried, however, he couldn't go in the direction of the current and create an opening for the others, the momentum and speed of the wind was simply too great for him to do such a thing with physical strength alone. With that known, he retracted his sword, a scowl once again present on his face. Damn it. Ichigo spat. Let me try. Natsu exclaimed. Immediately after he was about to run up and charge the wind barrier head on, a lone hand placed on his shoulder stopped him dead in his tracks. He turned to see that the ownership of said hand belonged to Ichigo, who had a stern look on his features. If my sword doesn't break through that wind barrier, trust me when I say that your fists won't. Even if you try, you'll just end up being hurt, and we need to save our strength. Ichigo said seriously. In any normal circumstance Natsu would have ignored the warning and charged in any way, however this was not a normal circumstance. Moreover, the tone Ichigo used was just too ominous, and something told him that those words rang true. But what else can we do? Natsu asked confusedly. The group collectively went silent, mostly due to the fact that they currently had nothing to offer. Charging into the barrier in the hopes of taking it down appeared. To be pointless and foolish, and waiting for Cage to come to would likely be a waste of time due to the fact that even if he were to wake up it was very unlikely that he would be able to use his magic energy to dispel the barrier. If I really had to. I could try to use my Getsuga Tens who to break through the barrier, which would probably work but even if it did the amount of spiritual energy I'd use would tear the station apart along with whatever in the city I would wind up hitting after it broke through. And that definitely wouldn't be an ideal outcome. 
Ichigo thought. However, the way that things were going he was beginning to think that they were fresh out of other options. Wait, Lucy, can't we just use your spirits? Natsu exclaimed, causing everyone else's ear to perk up as a result. What? Lucy uttered. Back at Evelyu's I was transported from one place to another through the spirit world. Natsu stated excitedly, believing that he had figured out a way to solve their dilemma. Yeah, but normal people would just suffocate to death in the celestial spirit world. Also it's against contract rules. I didn't mind when you did it before because it was Evelyu's key, not mine. Besides, I would have to have opened the gate from outside the wind barrier for that to even remotely work. Lucy replied, striking down that as an option. Lucy. I just remembered what I was trying to tell you on the way here. Happy exclaimed. What, you mean when you were calling me weird? Lucy asked. Here. Happy chirped, presenting a golden celestial spirit key to the blonde. How'd you get your hands on Virgo's key? Lucy exclaimed. Wait, who? Ichigo wondered aloud, his words matching the thoughts of both Urza and Grey. Oh yeah, that big gorilla-looking maid. Natsu recalled. Didn't anyone ever teach you not to steal? Lucy asked, punching the cat's mouth in a comical fashion. But I didn't steal it, Virgo asked me to give it to you. Happy stated, after which the blonde-haired wizard released him from her grip. We don't have time to waste on this kind of stuff. Gray scoffed. Apparently, her contract with Evelu ended as soon as he was arrested. Before we all left that day she came up to me and said that she wanted to sign a new contract with you Lucy. Happy explained. Thanks for letting me know, but I'll deal with her later. In case you didn't notice, we need to find a way out of here. Lucy stated. But? Happy began. Shut up. Why can't you just meow like a normal cat? Lucy asked, a dark aura surrounding her body as she pinched the feline's delicate face. She can be pretty scary. Gray commented. Probably learned it from Urza. Natsu mused, cheerfully observing the blonde's interaction with his best friend. I'm sorry. I just thought that since Virgo can drill holes, maybe she could dig through the ground and get us to the other side of the barrier. Happy stated in a dejected manner, obviously not taking the fact that his attempt at helping his comrades went over so poorly. She can what? Ichigo, Urza, and Grey exclaimed in unison. Oh yeah. Natsu trailed off, tapping his chin at the recollection of the pink-haired spirit's abilities. That's right. Why didn't you say that before, you brilliant, adorable little cat? Lucy cooed in an upbeat tone. I was trying to, but someone was pinching my face. Happy replied. My deepest apologies, now can I please have the key? Lucy pleaded, bowing humbly before the blue-haired feline. Give me some fish and all is forgiven. Happy chirped, after which he relinquished the key. By the way, see if you do away with that contract crap for right now. We don't have much time when Aragor has this much of a head start. Ichigo stated. I know, I was going to, but before I can even do that I have to summon her. Lucy replied. The blonde took the traditional stance she preferred to use when summoning a spirit for the first time, at which point she zoned out all other distractions and focused on the task of opening the celestial portal. I call upon thee, in the world of the celestial spirits. And now, I beckon you to my side at once, pass through the gate. Lucy encanted, flipping the key in the air before grabbing it with her hand. Open, gate of the maiden, Virgo. Lucy exclaimed. When the portal had opened and said spirit answered the call of the celestial wizard, the full form of the presumably ape-like creature was in full view. However, she was anything but how she had been previously described. Before the group stood a petite young-looking woman with pure blue eyes, peach-colored skin, and pink hair. She wore a maid's outfit, and for some reason sported a pair of shackles that were disconnected from one another other respective wrists. What can I do for you, mistress? Virgo questioned respectfully, bowing slightly to the blonde-haired mage. Who are you? Lucy uttered, seemingly incapable of saying anything else. What's up? Virga, man you look great. You've lost some weight. Natsu commented in a friendly manner. My name's Virgo, I apologize for any trouble I might have caused. Virgo replied. Wait, this is the maid that you said looked like a big ape. Ichigo asked confusedly, gesturing a finger towards the pink-haired spirit. Yeah, and she didn't just lose weight, she's a completely different person. Lucy shouted. I'm a very loyal spirit who'll do anything to please her wizard. Therefore I take on any form I feel my wizard will find most appealing. 
Virgo explained with a small smile. I dunno, I kind of like the other you better. Natsu thought aloud. Oh, I can fix that. Virgo stated. An instant later, and much to the surprise and dismay of everyone else present, the celestial spirit took on the very same form she daunted when working under Duke Evolu. Holy crap, she really did look like an ape. Ichigo thought. Don't listen to him. I'm your wizard and I like the other form better. Lucy shouted, prompting the spirit to obey and revert to her more petite visage. As you wish, mistress. Virgo replied. We are kind of short on time right now, so do you mind if we work out the details of our contract later? Lucy asked in a hopeful tone. Of course, whatever you'd like, mistress. Virgo replied, though a particular word she used had rubbed the blonde the wrong way. Do you really have to call me that? Lucy wondered aloud, sounding slightly annoyed. Oh? Would you prefer I call you queen? Virgo asked. No. Lucy immediately answered. What about princess? Virgo asked. Oh yeah, that'll work just fine. Lucy replied with a vain look about her features. Why does that not surprise me? Ichigo wondered aloud, getting a quiet chuckle from both Grey and Natsu. Can you please just drill a hole to the other side? We desperately need to get out of here, as soon as possible. Urza said, getting back on track. As you wish. Virgo stated. An instant later the pink-haired woman bowed slightly before she activated her magical abilities. A magic seal appeared underneath her feet, after which she went to work, quite literally. Within seconds a large hole appeared, giving everyone else the clear message that they had their ticket out. Let's get out of this joint. Gray said as he walked towards the hole. Hang on. Natsu trailed off, drawing all eyes to him. Everyone turned to see the dragon slayer, with the arm of their technical enemy hoisted across his shoulders and the body being supported as a result. It was very clear what the wizard's intent was, and yet still it was necessary to make sure. What do you think you're doing Natsu? Gray asked evenly. I don't really like him, but I'd feel guilty for him if we just left him here to die. Natsu stated. Well then I don't see a problem. Ichigo trialed off, throwing his own human body over his shoulders before he walked up to the dragon slayer's side. Very well. Urza permitted. Outside Oshibana Station, several minutes later. Looks like we made it out. Gray mused. It was more along the lines of stating the obvious given that every member of the group was currently looking back as the wind barrier continued to rage on the outskirts of the building they had just exited. Hey, where did Natsu go? Ichigo asked, shifting his head and finding not a trace of Fairy Tail's resident dragon slayer. I don't see happy either. Lucy commented. That probably just means that Natsu went after Eragor. Happy is capable of flying at extremely high speeds, so if ever there was a chance to catch up to Eragor, that'd be the one. Urza explained. It's no use, he'll never be able to catch up to Eragor, and neither will any of you. We can't be stopped now, we've won. Cage stated. The members of the group scowled down at the beaten and battered form of the Eisenwald wizard, shortly after which Ichigo set down his body and looked back to his teammates with a serious expression etched on his face. Though they were all confused by this, clearly he was about to say something and so no one bothered to voice said emotion. If Natsu went after Eragor then I'll go after him as fast as I can. I need one of you to put my human body in the magic mobile and head to Clover. With any luck, you'll run into us on the way there. Ichigo said before he began to walk off. Wait Ichigo, how are you going to catch up? I know you're fast, but still. Lucy said confusedly. What she says is true. It is best if you simply come with us on the magic mobile. Urza added. Trust me, I can catch up. Ichigo stated, releasing a slight chuckle. Before anyone could raise a question as to how or why the team though this, Ichigo vanished in a blur of light. It was almost as if he had just disappeared without a trace. What? Gray muttered, looking at the spot where the substitute had been standing with slightly widened eyes. Did he just vanish? Lucy questioned, looking to the scarlet head. Night for an answer. Yes. I believe he did. Urza replied. Moreover, she couldn't even sense his presence. It was as if he had traveled so far out of immediate sensory range that his movements couldn't even be detected. That was actual impressive, as the Queen of the Fairies had never seen anything like it in all her years as a wizard. Anyway, we should probably get going. 
Something tells me when we head to Clover we'll find Natsu and Ichigo on the way. Gray stated, prompting everyone else present to nod in understanding. Railway towards Clover, with Eragor. Eisenwald's ace currently flew towards the Guild Masters Conference without a care in the world. Actually, that wasn't true in that he cared a good bit about ending their lives, but at the same time he wasn't pressured in the slightest. His plan had, thus far, gone off without a single hitch. And those fairy tale flies are still trapped within my wind barrier. I have to say though that I regret not teaching the Queen of the Fairies and that orange-haired brat a lesson. Eragor thought. At the same time, killing the Guild Masters came first, he supposed. The silver-haired man abruptly stopped in his path, his eyes widening slightly as he sensed something incoming, and it was simply moving too fast to ignore. With a curious expression, he turned around, looking off into the distance to see what on earth was going on. What the hell is that? Eragor wondered. Off in the distance he saw an object that moved so quickly it was shining, but that was only for a brief moment. A second or two later it became closer, at which point he saw exactly what it was, and he simply couldn't believe his eyes. We've got YA now. Didn't know cats could fly at mock speeds did YA. Natsu shouted as he flew towards his the wind magic user, his own hands grabbing Happy's legs. What? Eragor uttered in a tone of disbelief. The flaming foot of the dragon slayer connected with his body shortly thereafter, causing an explosion to engulf Eragor's form and a significant amount of smoke to cover his fall towards the train tracks. Both Natsu and his opponent landed on their feet, the dragon slayer doing so with his back facing the wind magic user. He caught Happy in his hands a moment later, taking note that the Exceed looked incredibly tired and worn out. You all right little buddy? Natsu asked, a touch of concern making its way into his voice. I'm fine, but, so tired. I can't fly. Happy whispered weakly. Don't worry about it. I think I can handle it from here. Natsu replied, setting the blue-haired feline on the grounds below. You're one of those pesky fairy tale flies. I take it you're here to stop me. Eragor mused, after which his opponent turned to face him with a stern glare etched on his features. Why I got that right why I dress wearing windbag? I'm kicking your ass for fairy tale. Natsu exclaimed. Hey, funny. Get out of my way kid, or else. Eragor said warningly, bringing up a hand and gesturing an open palm towards the dragon slayer. A magical seal appeared before the extended open palm, after which a powerful gust of wind poured forth. It washed over the pink-haired mage like an unstoppable tide, little by little moving his feet backward whether he wanted them to or not. Is that all you got? Natsu taunted, immediately after which the wind picked up to such a speed that it caused a slight explosion where he stood. From the smoke and dust that resulted from Eragor's attack, the dragon slayer shot into the air, fire propelling his movements and flames once again covering his fists. He shot back down towards Eragor with all the fury of an actual dragon, power just written within his eyes. The reaper dodged the attack, leaping backwards and evading any significant damage. He did, however, get a front row seat to the pink-haired mage smashing his previous position into a million tiny pieces. I ain't letting you off that easy. Natsu exclaimed, lunging towards the silver-haired man without delay. Eragor brought up his scythe, effectively blocking the fiery enforced attack, and once again, getting out of the current engagement without any injury. When the dragon slayer proved to be done with his assault, the reaper then floated back into the air, gazing down at his opponent in an observational manner. Impossible, he uses his flames to jump and to strike. I underestimated his power, this might actually be a challenge. Eragor thought, releasing a slight chuckle to himself. Hey, what are you doing up there? Come down here and fight me like a man. Natsu demanded. Don't get to cocky fly. Eragor shouted, extending his hand and preparing to cast a powerful attack. What the hell? Natsu wondered, feeling a large amount of magical energy building from underneath his feet. Stormbringer! Eragor exclaimed, subsequently after which a large tornado-like burst of wind erupted from underneath his opponent. Natsu was spun around the vortex of wind. As if he truly weighed nothing at all. At the same time, he was helpless to do anything given that he couldn't even regain his footing to the point that he could exit the torrent of high-velocity air. Natsu! Happy uttered upon seeing his friend in trouble. The blue-haired cat tried with all his might to call forth his wings once again, but to no avail. He was simply too drained to do anything whatsoever, and, as a result, all he could do was watch. It's no use. I don't have enough magic energy. Happy thought aloud. A-A-A-A-A-A-A. 
Natsu screamed as he fell from the apex of the tornado, skyrocketing to the bottom of the canyon. Before he passed the ground level of the railway, a hand quickly grabbed his wrist, stopping his fall and effectively stabilizing his current trajectory. The dragon slayer looked up to see Ichigo standing on the side of the train tracks, with his hand firmly gripping his wrist. I've got you, now get your ass back up here so we can end this. Ichigo said with a smirk. Natsu responded in kind, smirking in a manner similar to his friend before he was pulled up, and once again felt the sensation of solid ground being located beneath his feet. If anything, the current situation only appealed to him because at least now he got to see more of what Ichigo could do. It still didn't make sense to him that the orange-haired teen managed to get here so fast. However, given that Ichigo saved him the trouble of wasting magical energy to bail himself out of the mess he had gotten himself into, he supposed it didn't matter at the moment. What's this, another fly comes to be swatted down. Aragor sneered from the air. You know something Aragor, you really piss me off. Ichigo stated, turning around and unsheathing his sword. Oh, and what are you going to do about it, fairy tale FL? Aragor began. He stopped his sentence the moment the form of the orange-haired teen appeared directly in front of him, with his sword cocked back, and prepared to cut him across his body. At the rate the sword was moving coupled with how quickly its wielder had appeared before him there was quite literally nothing he could do, but back up as quickly, as he was able and hope the blade didn't leave too deep a wound. I didn't even see him move. Aragor thought, sweating slightly in the build-up to the sword's impact with his flesh. The Eisenwald's ace's blood poured forth as the large cleaver-like Zampakuto cut across his body, leaving a fresh wound and simultaneously forcing the wind magic user to shoot backwards and fall into the ground in an attempt to gather himself. However, no sooner than he landed did the dragon slayer mount another attack in succession to his comrades first. The flaming fist connected directly with Aragor's cheek, catching him completely off guard, which subsequently sent the silver-haired man reeling across the train tracks yet again. That's what you get for messing with fairy tale. Natsu stated proudly. Nice hit. Ichigo complimented as he landed on the ground. Thanks for the opening to land it. Natsu replied, smirking heavily at the orange-haired teen. These insects dare to wound me. Aragor thought angrily as he picked himself off of the ground. The reaper floated off into the air once again, staring down at the two opponents and glaring heavily at them. Despite the fact that they currently had the upper hand, there was still a trick or two that he had yet to play. Hey, how did you move that fast back there? Natsu asked, turning to the substitute with a confused look etched on his face. What are you referring to? Ichigo asked. You know what I mean, when you vanished and appeared right in front of the worn-out windbag. Natsu clarified. I'll tell you later. For now we should finish this fight before Urza and the others get here. Ichigo stated. Right? Natsu replied after which they turned their collective vision towards the silver-haired wizard once again. Here, you flies are resilient, I'll give you that. However now I think it's time I got serious. Aragor began. The ice-fueled mage brought forth his scythe and placed it in front of his body, after which he tapped the shaft and began to spin it rapidly in circles. As it continued its motion, a large amount of magic energy manifested as wind began to gather, pulling and throwing around rocks and dust as it continued to rage. Wind Mail Aragor exclaimed. A large amount of wind surrounded his body, acting like a barrier and continuously raging on at high speeds. From first glance, it didn't look to be all that strong, but only time would tell, of course. That barrier would have to be pretty powerful for him to be that cocky again. Ichigo thought. He he he, this is one of my most powerful spells. All of your attacks are now useless against me. Aragor stated Karkly from within the confines of his wind mail. The Dark Wizard even went so far as to come back onto the ground, allowing both Ichigo and Natsu the chance to charge at him head on. It was either a show of arrogance, or the barrier was really just that strong. We'll see about that. Natsu scoffed. His fists lit up like a blazing inferno a moment later, after which he charged his opponent with everything he had, not giving an inch. Unfortunately, just as his punches were about to connect with the barrier the flames vanished, leaving the dragon slayer powerless and incapable of doing any significant damage. Get out of there Natsu! Ichigo exclaimed worriedly. The pink-haired wizard had heard the warning, but he was unable to respond to it. Without even a slight warning, Aragor sent a powerful blast of wind directly at Natsu, knocking him back far across the railway. Ichigo caught the dragon slayer and stabilized his would-be crash landing, 
after which he opted to use Flash Step in order to get the jump on the silver-haired man just as he had done before. He appeared directly behind the Dark Wizard and brought Zengetsu across the wind barrier and presumably Erigo's body. When the sword did nothing more than go along with the current of the wind barrier, Ichigo scowled, knowing full well that the barrier, though it was capable of being lightly penetrated, was far too thick to completely cut through. Well, that wasn't entirely true, but if Ichigo used the necessary force to cut through the barrier, he would end up slicing Eragor into two separate pieces, which he would like to avoid if at all possible. Nice try! Eragor shouted, turning around and making an attempt to send the orange-haired teen flying off just as he had previously done with the dragon slayer. However, the moment that he had turned and launched his attack was the very same moment he realized that the man was no longer behind him. With a scowl marking his face from beneath the wind barrier, Eragor turned to face his opponents once more. Though you are still in one piece, it matters not. It is as I thought, the both of you cannot break through my wind barrier, and your fire magic is completely useless against me. Eragor exclaimed. He isn't wrong, those flames will be snuffed out if Natsu comes in too close just by the direction of the wind, but is that really all there is to it? Ichigo wondered, thinking of a way he could get past the incredibly annoying magical spell. He could always just use Getsuga Tenzu, but that would be more than overkill, and there was also a high possibility that Eragor would be mortally wounded. If he wanted to accomplish that, then just slicing him in two would be infinitely easier. On top of that, and probably the greater of the two concerns involving the use of Getsuga Tenzu, was that an attack like that would completely blow away the railway, and doing so would definitely attract the wrong kind of attention towards him. Plus if I do end up blowing the train tracks away, I'm pretty sure the old man would throw a fit. Ichigo thought. The orange-haired teen continued to think on other possible avenues to defeat his and Natsu's collective opponent. However, none of them seemed very feasible unless the wind barrier was taken down. If that were to suddenly disappear, then they would easily be able to win. Wait, that's it. Ichigo thought. In a moment of realization, his eyes widened and he turned to Natsu, completely understanding a very specific way they could defeat the Reaper and save the Guildmasters. Natsu, crank up your flames as high as you can. Ichigo shouted urgently. The pink-haired wizard looked slightly confused at the odd request for a moment, but an instant later his expression twisted into a knowing smirk. He understood perfectly well where this was going, and if their hunch was correct, it would give them the victory. You got it. Natsu exclaimed, after which his body erupted in a torrent of fire and flames. A raging inferno extended into the sky, becoming a practical pillar of destruction as the dragon slayer roared on and on from within the epicenter. The heat quickly grew to an outrageous level of intensity, at which point the wind from Eragor's barrier did precisely what was expected. Impossible, my wind mail is, it's fading. Eragor thought in a slight panic. With the flames heating the air it's creating a high-pressure area, which is also drawing in the wind from Eragor's spell. Why to go Natsu? Happy cheered. His fire magic is so strong, how can he possibly be this powerful? Eragor thought, sweating as his protective barrier and practical trump card was so easily cast aside. He didn't even have time to come up with an effective countermeasure, as within the next moment Ichigo appeared out of thin air directly in front of him, after which he sent his Zampakuto slashing down the right side of Eragor's body without a second thought. The silver-haired man fell backwards, blood pouring from his wound and his eyes closing, likely due to the intense pain he currently felt. Without a doubt, however, he was out cold, and with that the victory went to fairy tale. You should have just given up when I offered. Maybe then we wouldn't have had to beat the crap out of you. Ichigo stated, though he knew the Eisenwald ace couldn't hear him. Is he gonna live? Natsu asked evenly, as he waked up to observe the defeated form of his opponent. Yeah, I didn't cut him too deep. He'll live, but he's down for the count. Ichigo replied. All right, we won. Natsu stated contentedly, dancing around in circles in a childish manner. Yeah, it looks like we did. Ichigo mused, releasing a slight chuckle upon staring back at the teen he had come to see as a good friend in such a short period of time. He sheathed Zengetsu once again, after which he kneeled down and took the lullaby flute from Eragor's possession. Doing so finally brought this battle to a close, and it also marked the defeat of Eisenwald, or so he thought. Good job by the way. You fought really well. Ichigo complimented, smiling at the pin-haired mage. Hey, you were really good yourself. We make a pretty good team, just like I thought we would. Natsu said with a wide grin. I guess so. Ichigo replied, releasing an inward chuckle at the words of the dragon slayer. Hey look, it's everyone else. 
Natsu shouted happily, pointing his index finger towards an approaching magic mobile. The vehicle came to an abrupt halt, skidding slightly across the rock that marked the railway, but successfully not running anyone over nonetheless. A moment later its occupants left the inside, after which the remaining members of their group were shown to wear proud smiles at the scene that greeted them. At the moment Urza was being supported by Lucy, likely due to the fact that her magical energy was still so drained. Opposite of those two, Grey walked on carrying Ichigo's body, which was a good thing given that the substitute had thought they had potentially forgotten it. Grey, why don't you have clothes anymore? Ichigo asked tiredly, at this point just accepting the fact that the raven-haired ice wizard had a habit of losing them. What are you? Grey began, looking down and instantly noticing that his clothes were missing. He then released a tired groan, but it had happened several times today thus far so there was really no use complaining about it. Never mind. Ichigo sighed out. Looks like you two really did get the job done after all. Urza amused, smiling slightly at the duo. Yep, here's our souvenir. Ichigo said jokingly, tossing the skull-headed flute towards the redhead in a nonchalant manner. Excellent, with this we have succeeded in saving Clover and the Guild Masters. Urza said contentedly. I'm surprised since Natsu was the first one to fight him. I was sure he'd screwed up. Grey scoffed. Hey, we beat him didn't we? Natsu exclaimed. Yeah, but I was worried for a second there. Happy muttered. What, you guys didn't think I could take down Eragor? Natsu asked as if the very notion insulted him. You were doing pretty well, but if Ichigo didn't show up when he did you were looking at a one-way ticket to the bottom of the canyon. Happy countered. I had it under control. Natsu stated defensively, though the words of the blue head cut seemed to cause the others to remember something. Speaking of which, how exactly did you catch up to Natsu so quickly? Lucy asked curiously. Yes, I would like to know as well. You simply vanished before our eyes and I couldn't sense your presence after you had. Urza added. Are you guys talking about that vanishing trick? It's really awesome. Natsu said excitedly. Vanishing trick. You mean? Ichigo began. A moment later a light buzz sounded off, after which his body, for a brief period of time, vanished from sight. He appeared a moment later directly behind Natsu, placing a hand on the dragon slayer's shoulders and effectively startling him and simultaneously impressing the group given that none of them had seen or predicted where he had moved. Gah! Natsu yelped, almost instantly jumping forward and turning around to see what had just touched his shoulder. Nice one! Grey complimented sarcastically, referring to the pink-haired wizard's evident distress. Why'd you have to do that man? Natsu exclaimed, clenching his heart as it was beating rather quickly. For a split second he thought Eragor had come to and was about to cut into his back, which wasn't exactly a pleasant thought. Sorry, but you wanted to see it again, right? Ichigo reasoned. What exactly is that technique? Are you teleporting or manipulating space, perhaps time? Urza guessed, eliciting a shake of the head from the orange-haired teen. No, not really. It's a technique called flash step that allows me to travel great distances by using my spiritual energy to forward my movements. When I do this, it allows me to move much faster than I would be able to at any natural speeds. Ichigo replied. Can other people wear? You're from do that too. Natsu asked from his position of sitting on the ground, having still not gotten up. Yeah, it's pretty common, but the speed of the flash step varies from person to person. Mine is pretty quick, but at the same time even I'm easily outclassed by a few other people in that regard. Ichigo explained. The substitute then looked towards his body, which Grey picked up on and then held up so as to allow Ichigo a free passageway back into himself, technically. A moment later the two separate forms became one, and once again the orange-haired teen opened his eyes and felt the release of being able to move freely in his own skin. By the way Natsu, you look like an idiot wearing that scarf while you're half-naked. Grey commented upon relinquishing Ichigo's body. You want to talk, hey, Lucy, give me your clothes. Natsu requested. In your dreams. Lucy growled. What the hell's the matter with you? You can't just say things like that, it makes you seem like a pervert. Ichigo chided, lightly smacking the dragon slayer on the back of his head. Ouch, what was that for? Natsu asked, rubbing his head slightly. Were you even listening? Ichigo exclaimed, though he knew the answer. The remaining members of the group chuckled at the display, after which the full weight of the situation finally reached them. Everything was over, in actuality, 
since the guild masters were safe and Eisenwald was defeated. Anyway, well done you too. Urza complimented. Before a reply could be made, the abrupt sound of an engine revving up came from down the railway. Each turned to see the magic mobile charging forward, with a very familiar backhead dark wizard sitting in the driver's seat, and a series of shadowy limbs extending all around. Two slow fairy tail flies. Cage exclaimed, driving past the group of enemy wizards and heading straight down the tracks towards Clover. As he passed, however, he didn't do so empty-handed. The shadowy tendrils grabbed two very specific items from the clutches of the fairy tale guild members. One was rather obvious, the death flute known as Lullaby, but the other was the wooden skull badge that Ichigo had used to access his powers. What the hell? Ichigo wondered, noticing the absence of the combat pass the second after it occurred. We have to go after him. Urza exclaimed. With a begrudging nod, each of the members began to run after the Rouge Wizard without delay. The one positive of the situation was that Cage didn't have all too much magical energy, at least in all likelihood. Due to this, even if Clover was just up ahead, he likely wouldn't be able to get there all that quicker than they would be able to. I just hope we make it there in time. Ichigo thought. Clover, forests outside the Guild Masters Conference, some time later. The raven-haired ice wizard stood in place atop a peak overlooking the Guild Masters Conference. He had been forced to abandon the Magi Mobile some time ago, and the sun had set around that very same time, but nevertheless he had made it with time to spare. Without a shadow of a doubt the Wizard Masters were present within that building, and his current location afforded him with a simply perfect position. From up here, Lullaby's magic will surely kill them, our time is here. Cage thought victoriously, tightening his grip on the demonic flute. A random noise from a nearby bush broke the dark wizard out of his thoughts, and incidentally startled him given that no one should actually be this far away from Clover and at this specific location. The only ones who were decent candidates to fill that slot were the fairy tale wizards that had followed him, but at the same time they shouldn't have been here so soon. He walked over to carefully examine the situation, after which he released an inward sigh of relief. It was just some random old man perversely enjoying a copy of what appeared to be Sorcerer's Weekly, and the previous week's edition no less. Oh wow, now that's really something. Makarov thought aloud, releasing a perverse giggle after he did so. Seeing this, however, gave the raven-haired mage an idea. Despite this man's appearance, he was definitely one of the guild masters, and that meant he was powerful. All the same, this opportunity presented a marvelous opening to test Lullaby's power firsthand. Excuse me, sir. Cage called out, startling the elderly mage as he did so. I it's not what it looks like. Makarov exclaimed, hiding the magazine behind his back as he spoke. The orange-clad man stopped his brief instance of panic upon getting a good look at the mere boy that had startled him so randomly. He appeared rather injured, bandages covering his body and his clothing torn. At the moment there wasn't even a shirt to cover his back. You've been hurt badly boy. You shouldn't be wandering around the woods in your condition. Makarov stated. Yes sir, it's just that I was. I was curious about. Something. I wanted to know if you'd care to hear a song. You see they wouldn't let me play it in the hospital, and I really would like for someone to hear me play. Cage replied in a friendly voice, smiling down at the rather short man. That's one creepy flute you got there. Makarov commented warily. I know, but it has a beautiful sound. Cage reassured, chuckling slightly as he spoke. Hum, well I should be going, but I guess one song couldn't hurt. Makarov mused, deciding that a few minutes wouldn't truly prevent Natsu's group from destroying a city. Oh thank you. Now, be sure to pay close attention. Cage stated, eliciting a nod from the elderly wizard. He brought the flute up to his mouth, realizing that this was it, the final moments before his triumph. It was fitting that the master of the fairy tale guild would be the first victim after all they did to him and his own guild, if not ironic. However, he paused, not bringing his lips to connect with the wood and not breathing into it so as to sound off the melody of death. Cage knew he should relish the opportunity, and yet his mind simply prevented him from acting. All the words, the fact that the fairy tale wizards had saved him, even the words of his comrades, popped into his head. The words of the annoying dragon slayer, of the orange-haired teen with the large sword, of the blonde celestial mage, everything they had ever said to him or in front of him contradicted what he thought to be true. Eragor and the others would essentially denounce the legitimacy of joining a legal guild, in fact they despised the notion. They even went so far as to scoff at the mere implication. If he too was of that opinion, then this should have been easy, but the fact of the matter was that it was far from it. 
why, why can't I bring myself to do it? It would be so easy, but what the things that they all said, were we, were we wrong, am I wrong in doing this? Cage wondered, not moving a muscle and standing in silence. Forrest's off to the side. There he is, he's with the master. Urza exclaimed. She and the others had come up towards the town and found the magic mobile off in the distance, a clear indicator that Cage was, in fact, somewhere close by. Now they had the dark wizard in their sights, however when they began to run forward someone stopped them. Shush, you're gonna miss the good part. Bob stated, bringing a finger over his mouth to further illustrate his request for silence. Most members of the group froze up at the sight of the effeminate bald man, who appeared to be cross-dressing at the moment. His appearance was just disturbing, but he seemed pleasant enough, perhaps too pleasant towards some. My, now aren't you boys just a bunch of cuties? Bob cooed. At this, Ichigo's expression turned into one of absolute terror. Natsu and Grey were much the same, however they had the added benefit of being able to move behind Ichigo, just in case they needed a human shield. Damn you're creepy. Ichigo muttered, which coming from him truly did mean something. Who's that guy? Lucy asked confusedly. That's Master Bob. Urza replied, sweat dropping as the bald-headed man began to dance very strangely around Ichigo, and by extension the two mags who still hid behind him. The strange man stopped a moment later, after which he relented and turned instead towards Urza. Oh, Urza honey, you've really filled out. Bob commented. You're telling me that Weirdo's the master of the Blue Pegasus Guild. Lucy asked quietly, though her tone was one of disbelief. Better question, why the hell aren't you stopping Cage? You guys seem to know what he's doing. Ichigo said. What day I mean by you guys? Natsu asked confusedly, momentarily putting aside the severe feelings of distress he was currently experiencing due to a certain quirky guild master. He he, this one's observant, I like that. Goldmine chuckled as he walked up to the group from within the woods. Master Goldmine. You're here as well. Urza asked confusedly. Yeah, now keep quiet. We are about to get to the good part. Goldmine replied. In the presence of two guild masters telling them not to do anything, the members of the fairy tale guild decided to take the order and reaming quiet. Why they were asked to, they didn't know, but nevertheless they clearly knew what they were doing. They continued to watch as Cage didn't do a thing, which actually surprised them given that he was so close to completing the mission of his guild. Despite this, the man was currently hesitating. Once this was evident, little by little, the remaining onlookers began to grasp what the guild masters were aiming at. Nothing's going to change. Makarov abruptly said, surprising raven-haired wizard with his words. W what? Cage muttered, taking note that the elderly wizard had turned his heel and allowed his back to face him. You cannot change the fact that those who are weak will remain weak, but I don't. Think that's a bad thing. I mean we humans are weak creatures by nature. Our insecurities are the reason that guilds even exist, and they're why we have friends. Makarov continued, turning to face the dark wizard once more. When we are surrounded by allies it's easy to stay positive about the future. Think of it this way, if we are clumsy we may stumble and bump into things, but as long as we have faith in our future we continue marching forward, our inner strength emerges on its own. But we have to choose that path and pledge to live our lives to the fullest. Don't let that silly flu get in the way. Makarov finished. Somewhat to the surprise of everyone pleasant, but most certainly to their relief and joy, the wooden death flute fell from Cage's hands and the dark wizard fell to his hands and knees in front of Makarov. A defeated expression on his face, but a burden clearly lifted from his shoulders. Well done old man. Ichigo thought with a smirk. He was starting so see exactly why the elderly wizard so respected and revered within the fairy tale guild. I surrender. Cage uttered. Why to go master? Natsu exclaimed as he and the others ran towards the elderly mage. What the, how did you kids get all the way here to Clover? Makarov asked confusedly. It's a long story. Ichigo replied. Does it end with a city being blown up? Makarov asked with a raised brow. Nope. Natsu replied. Then fantastic. Makarov stated, jumping into the air in a victorious manner. Master. Urza began grabbing the elderly mage and slamming his body into her armor. It was likely a gesture of mild affection, but it seemed to give the guild master a good bump on the head. I was so moved by your words I was almost brought to tears. Urza continued. Well that's just gramps for YA, why to talk your way out of another one? Grey commented. He 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 he. 
A demonic laughter sounded off. Everyone's eyes widened slightly upon that voice registering within their ears. They knew perfectly well that it belonged to no one present, which meant that it was definitely going to be something unexpected. That was ironic given that fact that this was not just the first, but the second time this ordeal was presumably over. I've grown tired of you wizards and your antics. The voice continued. An incredibly large magical seal appeared in the skies overlooking the conference hall. A moment later the death flute known as Lullaby floated towards the nexus of energy, its demonic voice evidently speaking as it did so. I shall devour you myself. The voice proclaimed. Shortly thereafter a flash of light erupted and the magical seal vanished, after which the flute was no longer present, but in its place was definitely something more terrifying. A large wooden monstrous-looking creature, with three eyes that shined with purple light, two arms, and a pair of legs now made itself evident. The creature also possessed small cutouts, made themselves present all throughout the body. I shall feast upon your souls. Lullaby exclaimed. It's so huge. Lucy shouted in terror. Why to state the obvious? Happy said nervously. What is that thing? Aragorn never said anything about a monster. Cage said as he gazed upon the demonic creature before them. We are in a pickle. Bob thought aloud. It must be a demon from the Book of Zareph. Goldmine reasoned. Why did the flute turn into a monster? Lucy questioned. That's its true form. It's forbidden black magic called living magic, Zareph's specialty. Goldmine explained. Who's Zareph? Wasn't he some wizard that died a long time ago? Grey thought aloud. He's the most evil wizard that ever lived. He was very powerful in his day, but in my wildest dreams I never thought his dark legacy would pop back up again. Bob replied. Now then, which of your delectable souls shall I devour first? Lullaby wondered aloud. Do you think souls are tasty? Natsu asked, turning to the raven-haired ice mage for an answer. How should I know? Grey shot back. My guess is no, and for the record you're not eating anyone's soul today. Ichigo stated, glaring confrontationally at the large demonic being as he spoke. Ha 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 ha, oh? Perhaps you shall be the first I devour. Lullaby mused. Not happening. Cage, give me the damn badge already. Ichigo requested. The dark wizard gasped slightly given that he had previously been petrified with fear, but an instant later he reached into his pocket and tossed the wooden object towards its owner. Upon grabbing it, the substitute ejected from his body, allowing Lucy to catch it given that she figured fighting a giant monster in his place would be less than preferable. What kind of magic is that? Bob and Goldmine wondered simultaneously. My, my, you are an interesting one. Your soul is brimming with power, oh yes, I shall most certainly devour you first. Lullaby stated, practically gushing at the spiritual energy that the orange-haired teen currently outputted. Natsu, Grey, Urza, we should take this thing down quickly before it destroys too much. Ichigo said. Hold on, I am the team's leader, and as such I will give the orders. Urza stated firmly. Knock yourself out. Ichigo replied, knowing full well that arguing at a time like this was pointless. Natsu, Grey, Ichigo, give this this everything you've got. Urza shouted. Each of whom she had addressed firmly nodded, and an instant later the four ran off in unison, leaping upwardly towards the massive creature without a moment's hesitation. Ichigo unsheathed his sword, Natsu brought his fire to cover his fists, Urza prepared to dawn her armor, and Grey prepared to shoot the creature full of ice. Requip! Urza exclaimed. She opted to summon her heaven's wheel armor as she continued to near the creature, after which she began slashing directly through the midsection of the massive creature and effectively giving a convenient opening to her comrades as it tried to collect itself. Ice make lance! Grey exclaimed from the ground, firing off a slew of ice lances directly at the body of the massive demon. It wailed in pain as the attack pierced its skin, even recoiling slightly due to the fact that the magical ice had hit its from its side. Fire Dragon's Iron Fist Natsu shouted, slamming his fist into the demon's neck and subsequently punching a hole through it. Insolent fools! Lullaby exclaimed, making to swat the dragon slayer. Its aim was offset a moment later courtesy of the two swordsmen that had started to chop and slash at random parts of its body, flying around or leaping and attacking it without relent. Enough of this! Lullaby shouted, stomping its foot on the ground so as to create enough of a shockwave to rid itself of its attackers for a brief moment. Ichigo was forced to use flash step to appear on the ground, Natsu was forced to jump off the demon's body, 
and Urza was forced to fly backwards, lest they each be hit by the force of the defensive move. However, it was beyond the shadow of a doubt that they currently had the upper hand. The demon currently had holes covering its body, and despite its size the wounds were noticeable. What's more was the fact that the wounds inflicted by the orange-haired teen specifically burned, even after the impact. It was as if it cut into the very fabric of its magic, which should have been impossible. That blade of yours, who are you, child? What magic do you use that allows your sword to burn my skin at the touch? Lullaby asked. My name's Ichigo Kurosaki, and I don't have time to explain something like that to a demon that's about to meet its end. Ichigo replied. Ha! Huh. It is not I, but you who will meet his end here today. Behold my melody of death! Lullaby exclaimed. It took a large breath of fresh air, after which it gathered magical energy within its throat and prepared to release. If the song was capable of getting gout, then no one was safe. Not the guild masters, and not the fairy tale guild members. When it finally did preform the spell, however, nothing happened. Just a quiet little squeak sounded off from within its throat, which clearly surprised the large demon a great deal. What happened? Lucy exclaimed. I don't understand, why can't I play my melody of death? Lullaby shouted confusedly. They must have poked so many holes in it with their attacks that it can't make play its music. Cage reasoned. Talk about anticlimactic. Lucy commented. Flutes are pretty lame to being with. Happy added. You dare to mock me. Lullaby roared. A moment later it shot a powerful energy projectile directly at the group that still sat atop the hillside. They, in turn, began to panic as the energy came closer and closer to hitting its target. Lucy. Urza, Natsu, and Grey exclaimed in unison. Not one to allow his comrades to be injured if he could help it, Ichigo appeared directly in front of the energy projectile and stopped its path with his Zampakuto. At first the attack managed to push him back, causing his feet to skid across the rocky terrain and displace a good bit of the ground. Nevertheless it seemed he was capable of blocking something so powerful with just his basic sword. To be able to block such an attack. Urza thought, knowing full well that there were only a select few of her armors that could accomplish such a thing. A moment later the attack was proven not only to have been blocked, but outright deflected. Once he had regained his footing, Ichigo slashed his Zampakuto forward with as much force as he could, effectively dispelling Lullaby's attack and rendering a large majority of those present speechless at the very sight. Impossible. No one should be able to block my attack. Lullaby shouted defiantly. You know what? I've had just about enough of hearing your voice. I think it's time to shut you up once and for all. Ichigo stated. The large demonic creature made to reply, but its voice caught. In its throat at the feel of what happened next. Ichigo extended his sword horizontally forward, supporting his right arm with his left and gathering a large amount of spiritual energy. His power surged into the sky and around his body, taking the form of a raging blue pillar of raw energy that shot up as far as the eye could see. Most began sweat slightly at the feel of what each had never felt before in their existence. So much energy and yet it didn't feel like magic, not at this concentration at least. What kind of power is this? Urza wondered, watching as the energy continued to build up. Getsuga. Ichigo began, bringing his sword back. Lullaby watched as the sword was cocked back, but the raw power that it sensed seemed to paralyze it. For some reason it simply couldn't move. However, even if it could, it likely wouldn't have been able to dodge the attack given how massive it soon showed itself to be. Tenzu. Ichigo shouted. A colossal burst of blue energy poured forth from the blade as it was swung forwards, consuming absolutely everything in its path. The winds burst in all directions at high speeds, and even the guild masters themselves could only look at the attack with a sense of awe. The light blue glow of the attack completely eclipsed the form of lullaby, and all that could be heard were its screams of torment before all of a sudden it just stopped making sound altogether. When the energy had dissipated, the giant monster was completely gone. The only thing that remained was the flute from whence it came. However, as that very same flute began to fall towards the ground, it began to turn into dust, slowly evaporating until absolutely nothing remained. For a moment no one said a thing, all they could do was stare at where the massive creature previously stood, and where the attack courtesy of the orange-haired teen has just recently eclipsed. His attack destroyed the flute. But that shouldn't have happened, no magic in the world has the power to undo Zeref's curse, but perhaps that isn't it. Makarov thought, knowing full well that Ichigo wasn't even capable of using what they would call magic. There, now we are done. Ichigo stated in a tired tone, 
allowing Zengetsu to rest on his back once more within the cloth that traditionally covered the blade. Wow that was a hell of an attack. Natsu exclaimed, marveling at the destructiveness of the substitute's technique. Indeed. That was impressive, to say the least. Urza commented, her voice still holding a touch of awe. I'll say. Lucy commented. I. Happy said, nodding in agreement. That attack was really something else, Ichigo. However the destructive capabilities are the second most surprising thing about it, what I really didn't expect was for it to destroy Lullaby completely. Makarov stated. Well it's a good thing it did, that flute was way too dangerous to be left alone. Ichigo said, his words ringing all too true. The kids got a point, but up until now no one had been able to destroy the damn thing, that's why it was sealed away. Goldmine thought, giving off a neutral expression despite his rather active mind. Still I can see why you wouldn't want to use that every chance you got. If you did it back at the station to destroy the wind barrier you'd probably have blown away the building too. Gray stated. Yeah, and that's exactly why I didn't use it back there. I'm just glad when I finally did use that attack I didn't end up blowing up anything important. Ichigo replied, inwardly smirking since he thought he had succeeded in doing so. You mean like the Guild Masters Conference Hall? Lucy asked blankly. Yeah, like. Ichigo began, only to turn around and look at the very structure that the blonde-haired celestial mage had been referring to. When he did so, however, his previously content expression was replaced with one of disbelief. It had seemed that due to the massive size of the demon that he had just recently destroyed, he failed to see the conference hall was directly behind it when he had launched his attack. The end result was that the structure was now nothing more than a crater, having been completely decimated. Whoa, you completely tore it apart. Natsu stated excitedly. Guess you really are a fairy tale wizard at heart. Gray mused with a chuckle. Urza said nothing, and while she didn't really approve of destroying large amounts of property, that indeed was one of the qualities a fairy tale wizard unfortunately always had to have, and she couldn't have done a better job destroying the conference hall herself. Of course she'd never say that out loud, but it's the thought that counted. Ah uh ah. -uh. Makarov groaned out, paling at the sight of the destroyed building. Damn it. Ichigo muttered under his breath. He was so close to having completed a job without blowing something up, and with the company he currently kept that was most certainly an achievement. It was actually ironic. Given that he was likely the only one who had intended to finish the mission without too much damage being done to property. The substitute's mental self-loathing was cut short when Natsu walked up behind him and patted him on his shoulder. This caused Ichigo to turn and face the pink-haired teen and gaze upon his cheerful grin, which did confuse him, but at least it meant the dragon slayer was making an attempt to make him feel less horrible. Cheer up, I blow stuff up all the time. It's no big deal. Natsu stated, causing the orange-haired teen to sight. That doesn't make me feel all that better. Ichigo replied. Chapter 12 Era, Meeting Chambers of the Magic Council The members of the Magic Council stood in conference, each with a pensive expression on their respective face, and their thoughts rather conflicted. In traditional fashion the topic of discussion was the guild that brought out these exact feelings nearly every time it was brought up, otherwise known as fairy tale. Time and time again the council had debated on whether or not they were a problem, or if they were too unruly, or if they were simply a guild of party animals whose energy could be steered towards positive ends. In any case, they were a frequent topic of discussion. Currently, they were discussed in unison with the defeat of the Dark Guild Eisenwald. In truth the council owed Fairy Tail a great deal for saving the guild masters and simultaneously taking down a group of criminal wizards. Moreover, a dark and terrible demon that had henceforth not been killable was actually erased from the face of the earth, which could only be seen as a positive if they were to just look at that individual consequence of the unruly guild's actions. At the same time, they couldn't just let them off the hook just because their actions benefited them because that would cause them to lose respect and appear as if any guild could do whatever they wanted whenever it suited them. That would just be chaos, and they couldn't very well allow that to happen. With these being the two conjoining truths of the situation, the evident dilemma of what to do presented itself. The Dark Guild Isuald may have been defeated, but that is only one small victory in a much larger battle. Org stated. The man was a tall and elderly in nature, having grey hair and a considerably long beard with a coupled moustache. He had pointy ears and wore multiple layers of white robes, which appeared to be the traditional fashion of the council members. The number of dark guilds has been growing at quite an alarming rate. Michello added. 
The man who had just spoken was a short old man with very flat brown hair that pointed outwardly in three different directions. Either side of his head also sported what appeared to be a pair of cat-like ears that appeared to be nothing more than spiked up hair, and a light yellow tail seemed to grow out of his backside. He had a bristle-edged moustache, and overall gave off the appearance of a cat by several measures of the word. We have to come up with a plan to eliminate them all. Leggy piped in. He was a fairly tall middle-aged man with large lips, tan skin, black hair coupled with huge sideburns, and bits of hair covering his chin. He sported a pair of small, round, shaded glassed and also wore a cloak typical of a Magic Council member, only he chose to wear the hood up as opposed to the other's choice. But how would we do that? Belno questioned. The female council member was a tall elderly woman with sandy blonde hair tied in a large ponytail style. She too wore a robe like the other council members, but underneath she sported a purple turtleneck, being the only one on the council who actually did so. This situation does present us with a clear dilemma, but at the same time at least one part of Zeref's magic has been destroyed. Org replied. Even so we must also consider how Eisenwald managed to get their hands on such a powerful form of dark magic in the first place. Yajima reasoned. He was a short elderly man with thick light brown eyebrows and a small toothbrush moustache. Incidentally, he was one of the only members without a robe, choosing to wear a brown long-sleeved shirt with a very odd black three-spiked hat. I hate to say it, but the blame may extend all the way to the highest levels. Michello stated. Whatever the case, although they are usually just a thorn in our sides, fairy tale proved to be quite useful. Seagrain commented. The male member of the Magic Council had slightly long blue hair, brown eyes, and an intricately designed red tattoo that was located above and under his right eye. He wore a long white tunic with black stripes across the edges over top a dark shirt and matching pants and shoes. His disposition, however, was rather arrogant, or at the very least a more smugly oriented sense of calmness. They took down an entire guild with just a handful of wizards. That is quite a feat, Altia added. Bringing a sleeve to cover her mouth as she spoke. The woman who spoke had slightly pale skin, red lipstick lightly coating her lips, dark purple hair, and brown eyes. She had a noticeably voluptuous figure, and currently wore a variation of the council's uniform consisting of a rather bland white garb that covered her upper and lower body, a dark yellow sash that tied around her waist, a red collar-like object around her neck, as well as the left arm being long-sleeved and the right having no sleeve whatsoever. She appeared to be rather playful in nature, but simultaneously had the capability of being serious when the time called for it. You may not want to accept it, but that's the reality of the situation. In the end the attack on the guild masters was prevented, lives were spared, and none of us had to give up our hard-earned positions on this council to save face. Seagrain stated. You fool, are you insinuating the council is somehow to blame? Leggy exclaimed. That's enough. We must get back to the topic at hand. Org stated. Speaking of which, it should specifically be taken into consideration that the forbidden lullaby was successfully destroyed, something we have been incapable of doing thus far. Seagrain said. That fact only makes the situation more complicated than it already is. There was a reason that we were unable to destroy it and even now we don't know how this was possible. Moreover the wizard that is said to have destroyed it is someone we do not have any previous records of. Org countered. Yes, and we can't overlook the fact that someone capable of such power should not have been able to go under the radar of the Magic Council for so long, it doesn't make any sense. Belno added. We do have records of him being present during the events that lead to the capture of Bora of Prominence. He apparently fought off the man alongside Natsu Dragnil. Altia stated. So this man appeared out of thin air and is capable of doing the impossible with his magic. I find that extremely troubling. Org replied. All the more reason to bring him to us and inquire about his history, wouldn't you say? Seagrain reasoned. What would you have us do? Org asked. We require a scapegoat from Fairy Tale, someone who is well known, and we also require an audience with this mysterious wizard that has done what we all thought to be impossible. However, simply bringing him along as the scapegoat won't be enough, therefore I suggest we pick an iconic Fairy Tale wizard and play it off as having both of them being punished. Seagrain suggested, smirking as that idea seemed to sit very well with the other members of the council. Interesting, so you are suggesting that we bring this man alongside another and use that as an excuse to question him, that would work out rather well for us. And seeing as how it allows us to hit two birds with one stone, I do not see any reason to deny your plan's viability. Org replied. Still, who would you suggest we bring in alongside this mysterious fairy tale mage? 
Michello inquired, prompting the blue-haired man to smirk amusedly. Oh, I know just the person. Seagrain began. Magnolia, Fairy Tale Guildhall. The doors to the large wooden building opened rather suddenly, drawing the attention of each of the members that currently sat within it, be they looking for work or simply passing the time with friends. Among the group was the master, Urza, Natsu, Grey, Lucy, Happy, and Ichigo, each of whom were deathly quiet. Natsu and Grey simply glared at one another while the blonde-haired celestial mage just stared at them with a deadpanned expression, with Happy sitting atop her shoulder. Their respective looks gave away nothing, but the remaining three seemed to give off the impression something bad had happened. Master Makarov looked rather annoyed, more specifically it was the look he gave off whenever he received a rather extensive damage report. Urza appeared to be feeling rather guilty, almost as if she blamed herself in some manner for what had happened, and Ichigo just gave off a somewhat defeated look. Hello Mater Makarov, you're back earlier than expected. Myra Jane greeted cheerfully. Yes. I am, aren't I? Makarov replied, directing a glare at the orange-haired teen to his right. I am missing something here. Myra thought, looking at both the master and the substitute confusedly. I said I was sorry. Ichigo trailed off, not even bothering to look back at the elderly mage to see the look on his face. The entire trip back to Magnolia, Makarov had been giving him the same look whenever the topic of what had happened was brought up. That, incidentally, happened numerous occasions on the train ride given that Natsu would continuously bug him about how strong the attack was, which also occurred more than was necessary because said dragon slayer would keep forgetting the explanation that was given to him. Needless to say the look of annoyance was deeply imprinted into his memory for the time being. I know you did, but that doesn't mean I can't still make you feel guilty about it. Makarov pointed out, his expression unchanging. Ichigo just sighed tiredly, as if to say he knew on some level he deserved it. At the same time it hadn't been his intention to destroy the conference hall, but that still didn't change the fact he blew it into smithereens. You know, this is kinda funny when it isn't happening to me. Natsu commented, releasing a slight chuckle. And I'm so glad you can find this entertaining. Ichigo commented sarcastically. I? Happy chirped. Master, once again, I will say that the responsibility for what happened lies with me. I was the head of the mission hence it is my duty to bear the burden of anything going awry. Urza stated. And let Ichigo off the hook so easily. Fat chance. Makarov replied. He released a slight chuckle upon hearing an annoyed groan from his right, though whatever fun he might have had was interrupted by a rather confused barmaid. Some context would be nice. Myra said. Oh, well you see these five decided to take on a dark guild that was trying to kill off everyone at the Guild Masters Conference by using a form of death magic created by the Black Wizard Zeref. They did win, but I'd like it if Ichigo would kindly finish the story for me. Makarov requested. Fine, anyway, some kind of demon called Lullaby appeared and tried to finish the job that Eisenwald couldn't. Now, in my defense, it was really huge. Ichigo began. I can attest to that. It was relatively the size of a small mountain. Urza commented. Yeah, so when I went to beat it I couldn't see the conference hall behind it, and I. Ichigo said, only to be cut off. You blew up the conference hall, didn't you? Kana guessed, releasing a slight chuckle upon receiving a nod of confirmation from the orange-haired teen. Wait, so you destroyed a demon that big with one attack? Myra asked, sounding awestruck. It wasn't every day that she heard news of something like that happening, and it also gave away a good bit about how strong their latest members' abilities were. Yeah, it was freaking awesome. Natsu shouted excitedly. For once I agree. Grey piped in. I? Happy said. It was pretty impressive. Lucy commented. Indeed. Urza said, honesty prevalent in her tone. Wow, must have been a hell of an attack. Kana reasoned from her position at the bar. The rest of the guild seemed to nod or mutter in agreement on that, but the fact remained that the master himself wasn't quite so taken aback by the attack that it made him lose track of what was really important. You're all missing the point. Makarov exclaimed, a tick mark popping out on his forehead. And that was. Ichigo trailed off, as if requesting for the master to clarify. That my mini vacation was ruined. Makarov replied in a saddened tone. Shortly thereafter he began to cry streams of photos, wailing all the while. He definitely isn't going to let this go. Ichigo thought, releasing an inward groan. The master will be fine, Ichigo. For now I would just advise you just avoid bringing up recent events. Urza stated. All right. 
Ichigo replied. It made sense to just give the old man some space since he obviously wasn't going to just drop what had happened. At the very least the fact that he didn't seem truly mad was a good sign, but, even so, time would be needed before this blew over. With those thoughts in mind, the orange-haired teen walked over to the main bar, and slammed his head onto the wooden surface, just wishing for a brief moment that the master's wailing wouldn't be able to reach his ears. Nope, didn't work. Ichigo thought. His inward self-loathing was then cut off upon hearing the characteristic giggle of the bubbly white-haired barmaid that worked at the guild. He pulled his head up a moment later, taking note that yet another person seemed to get some sense of humor out of his stupidity. In some way that was a silver lining. Rough day. Myra asked in a friendly manner. It wasn't too bad all in all. I guess I just need to work on my aim a little bit. Ichigo replied, chuckling slightly. Well, you can't have everything going exactly as planned. How you got here in the first place would be a good example of that, I guess. Myra said. Yeah, you're right about that. To be honest though, I'm just happy to be back. That road trip was annoying, way too much train travel for my tastes. Ichigo thought aloud. I get what you mean. One of the good things about working in the guild hall itself is that I don't have to travel too far. Myra replied, smiling as she always did. The conversation the two were currently engaging in was cut off for a brief period of time by a collective bout of giggling that sounded off from a nearby table. Hearing this, Ichigo turned and saw a group of five women staring almost directly at him, still continuing with their girlish laughter all the while despite the fact that he was currently looking at them. It took a few seconds, but eventually they noticed that he was looking directly at them, and with that one of the female wizards shushed the rest and they took their eyes off of him. However, Simply because their laughter had stopped didn't mean that Ichigo's confusion had. It still remained to be seen why on earth they were staring at him in the first place. That was weird. Ichigo thought aloud, sounding confused. Yes, it really was. Myra commented, a blank expression on her face as she continued to wash cups. In all honesty she had thought, for a moment, that the girls were staring at her, but it was very clearly the man that kept her company. That in mind, she was still just as lost as he was. What was that about? Ichigo asked, turning around once again to look at the white-haired woman. I don't really know. Myra replied honestly. You really don't know? Well then, I might be able to help you out a bit. Kane amused as she walked up to the bar, a smirk etched on her face. Um, did something happen? Ichigo asked confusedly. Why don't you see for yourself? Kana replied, releasing a chuckle as she spoke. The brown-haired woman's words confused the two individuals that had heard her, mostly because they were very ambiguous and not all too helpful. Ichigo raised a curious brow, preparing to ask what she had meant, but he stopped himself upon the woman presenting him with a magazine and placing it directly in front of him on the wooden surface of the bar. Sorcerer's Weekly Ichigo wondered aloud, looking back at the booze enthusiast upon taking the magazine into his own hands. It just came out this morning. Go to page 7 and trust me when I say you'll understand. Kana stated. Immediately thereafter the substitute turned to the page that the renowned drinker had asked him to, and no sooner than he did that did his face light up in a brilliant shade of red. Damn it. Ichigo sighed out, burying his face into his hands and dropping the magazine as he did so. What could be so bad? Myra Jane wondered aloud. The white-haired woman took the magazine and turned to the page in question after which she instantly understood why Ichigo had reacted the way he did. The entirety of the page was a large image of the very same group photo that the both of them had been a part of. Naturally this would be embarrassing for him, most likely because he didn't want to take it in the first place, but even so he had to know this would happen eventually. After all, he did take a wonderful photo. However, two things were amiss about the picture that Myra immediately took note of. Firstly, the blush on Ichigo's face had been toned down a good amount. You could still make out a little bit of it on the photo, but it made him look more innocent and charming which was likely why they kept it that way. The second thing she noticed, and the more glaring of the two, caused the barmaid to blush herself. While taking the photo she had thought herself to be nowhere near as close as she did in the final print. Her chest was pressing up against the substitute's shoulder blade, something that did happen, but she perceived it as only a slight touch. Oh my! Myra muttered, bringing a hand up to cover one of her cheeks so as to prevent a certain brown-haired woman from seeing her heated face. By the way, nice abs Ichigo. Kana abruptly commented, a wicked smirk present on her features as she did so. I, um. I. 
Ichigo mumbled, trying and failing to find an excuse for why the photo was taken in the first place. Realistically, there was no way he could convey the story that made him look good. You should do these photo shoots more often. Kana said, winking at the teen and effectively causing his blush to deepen. I it was a one-time thing. Plus I was asked to buy all of the models so I really couldn't say no. Ichigo replied defensively. Really, all of them you say? Kana wondered aloud, redirecting her devilish smirk towards the barmaid. The white-haired woman knew perfectly well where this conversation was heading, and she really didn't like it one bit. In fact, she gave a slight glare at the talented binge drinker, as if to warn her that this was the case. Now I wonder why Myra Jane would do something like that. Kana said playfully. Kana. Myra Jane muttered warningly. Oh, is that the latest issue of Sorcerer's Magazine? Lucy asked, walking over to the bar and joining the others. Yes, it is. Help yourself, though I advise you look at page 7 first. Kana said, taking her eyes off of the barmaid and redirecting them towards the incoming blonde. Upon hearing this, Myra released an inward sigh of relief. The last thing she needed was to be teased relentlessly by Kana since her threats could only go so far to quell the woman's urge to mess with people. It did seem a bit unfortunate that it occurred due to the fact that Ichigo was such an easy target, but even so. Oh wow, nice abs. Lucy exclaimed upon seeing the picture. That's what I said. Kana stated. Once again the group of females that were likely close enough to hear the conversation began to giggle, only this time in a more perverse manner. This, in turn, caused Ichigo to release a groan and once again gently place his head against the wooden surface of the bar. What is it that you are all looking at? Urza asked curiously as she came up to the group. The substitute heard the distinct sound of the magazine being taken into the redhead's metal-covered hands, at which point he brought his head up once more and fully expected to be hit, or something for how unseemly the photo was. Somewhat to his surprise, the strongest of fairy tales female wizards just blushed before placing the magazine on the bar once more. I, I would have never expected such things from you, Ichigo. Urza said, her expression being one of clear surprise. It wasn't my idea in the first place. Ichigo exclaimed. What you're looking at? Natsu asked as he too came up towards the group. The pink-haired teen instantly took the magazine off the bar, took it in his hand, and looked directly at the page that Urza had so kindly laid flat against the surface. He then turned to look at Ichigo and released a slight chuckle. So this is how you got the extra 50,000 jewel. Natsu reasoned. That's all you got. Whoever paid you got a huge deal off of that one. Kana stated before taking the magazine back in her hands and looking at the picture once again. W what? Ichigo stuttered, his blush coming back once again. Oh don't play dumb. Female wizards read this stuff just as much as the male ones do, and sometimes for the exact same, visual pleasures. Kana finished, making sure she over-exaggerated the degree to which she was looking at the photo. Why me? Ichigo thought, releasing an outward sigh. Thus far he currently had a reputation as someone who blew up a building and managed to annoy the master, the last thing he thought he needed was something like this. Ahem. I am. Um, I highly doubt that the picture will end up being all that popular. Myra said in an attempt to comfort the orange-haired teen. She did feel somewhat guilty since, after all, it was partially her fault he took the picture. Her words, however, caused Kana to look at her with an expression of disbelief, after which she turned the magazine around and set the picture directly in the barmaid's line of sight. It could be worse. Myra continued, though she sounded far more unsure than prior. The brown-haired wizard simply moved the picture closer to the point that it was directly in front of her face as a result. Is it too late to say sorry? Myra asked jokingly. It's, it's not such a huge deal. It'll roll over eventually. Ichigo replied, though in truth he was not entirely sure of that. Oh, is that the latest issue of Sorcerer's Magazine? Makarov asked as he came over. Ichigo wanted to sigh, but at this point he just didn't care. As a result, he said not a word as the collection of photos and articles was handed down to the shortly built wizard. In fact, the very same page that had thus far caught everyone's attention was still opened wide. Wahahahaha. Makarov roared, almost buckling over at the sight of the picture. What's so damn funny? Ichigo asked, blushing slightly since he was very clearly being mocked. You know, I just never pictured you as a model, Ichigo, what with you seeming like a prude and all. Makarov thought aloud, wiping away a tear from his eye. I am not a prude. Ichigo shouted defensively. 
Clearly not. Wahahahaha. Makarov laughed out. That's, you just, how can, whatever. Ichigo said, just accepting the fact that he couldn't really defend himself in this instance. Cheer up my boy. I've got something to say that might brighten up your mood a little bit. Makarov stated, ceasing his boisterous laughter. The words of the elderly wizard somewhat confused those who had heard him, but none of them bothered to say anything given that a moment later the master jumped atop the bar and made to address the entire guild. Listen up everyone. I've got something to say about what happened over at the conference I went to. Now I'm not all too happy about the damages, but I'll tell you one thing, the job got done. A demon from the Book of Zeref was taken down by fairy tale wizards, some of the strongest fairy tale wizards we have, and on top of that we took on a dark guild and tore them to shreds. If that ain't worth celebrating I don't know what is, so let's make up for my lost vacation time. Makarov stated. The entire guild erupted into cheers a moment later, shortly after which everyone lunged at one another. Normally someone would have done something about it, but perhaps a celebration of some kind was in order. Well, I can't say I didn't see that coming. Ichigo thought. Aloud, starting into the virtual dust cloud of smoke with fists and feet swinging all around and within it. They are just letting loose, my boy. Do me a favor and let them enjoy the day, and yes I'm looking at you Urza. Makarov said as he jumped down from his position at the bar. I will do no such thing unless things get out of hand. Urza replied, though she did sound slightly disappointed that she wasn't currently allowed to do anything. It was just nice to always have the option. The redhead just sat down on a nearby bar stool, obviously not wanting any part to do with the fight. She appeared to be very calm, which was really saying something given that it was exceedingly noisy in the guild at the moment. Myra continued to go on as she always did, and Kana simply walked off towards a table away from the fight with a mug in her hand and a small smile etched on her face. Speaking of fights, why aren't you diving into this one? Ichigo asked, turning to face the pink-haired teen to his left. He he he, well normally I would, but I wanted to introduce you to a few people that I don't think you've had the chance to meet yet. Natsu replied, his characteristic grin present on his features. Really? Who do you have in mind? Ichigo asked. The pink-haired dragon slayer just gestured Ichigo to follow him with his hand as opposed to giving a verbal response, after which the two began to walk across the guild to a nearby table. At said table sat four individuals that he had seen before around the guild but had never really spoken to. They all seemed rather cheerful if their respective friendly smiles were anything to go by, which at least implied they were approachable. Among the group were a total of three men and a single girl who looked to be at maximum 17 years of age, and that was being generous. Three sat on one side of the table while a lone male sat on the other, appearing as if they had been conversing before he and Natsu had decided to come up to them. One of the wizards was a slim young-looking man with orange hair though most of it was hidden under a tall brown and white striped hat with alternating colors. The teen wore an open light brown coat that had yellowish fur trimmings over top a collared purple shirt with its collar mostly left hanging open. His lower body was covered in nothing more than a standard-looking pair of shoes and black pants. The man that sat nearest to him was a tall, slim young man with black hair styled in a very distinctive manner. He wore a simple white t-shirt with checkered green pants and a pair of dark shoes with soles that appeared to be on the lighter side. The one and only female, incidentally, sat between these two and appeared to be the most friendly, if not the most approachable, of the group. This particular wizard was a young, petite girl with a slender build and shoulder-length blue hair that was held up by a colorful bandana. She wore an orange dress with a bow tied over her shoulders and making its appearance between her breasts. Last among the group was the man that sat across from them. He was a rather large muscular individual with tan-colored skin and spiky white hair that was styled upwards. The man wore what seemed like something akin to a school uniform by the standards of the substitute's world, its appearance being a simple dark blue jacket with purple in its complete with a pair of matching pants. I was wondering when we'd finally get to meet the man from another world. The tall-hatted individual thought aloud. Be nice. The only female gently chided. Yeah, sorry about that, but I haven't really gotten a chance to meet everyone just yet. My name's Ichigo Kurosaki, it's nice to meet the four of you. Ichigo began. My name's Jet, and my buddy here is Droy. We are two-thirds of one of Fairy Tales' best teams. The orange-haired wizard stated. I'd be the last part of that team. My name is Levi McGarden, and I and my two friends over here make up Shadow Gear. The blue-haired girl said in a friendly manner. Shadow Gear. Is that the name of your team? 
Ichigo guessed, eliciting a nod from the petite young mage. Don't worry, our team will get one eventually, we just gotta come up with a name. Natsu said reassuringly. I wasn't too worried about that, and back on topic, I noticed you weren't really mentioned in that team. So what's your name? Ichigo asked, looking at the white-haired man. I'm Ethelman Strauss, and before you ask that's not a coincidence. Myra Jane is my big sister. The muscular man stated, ending with a small chuckle. I can see that, not too many people have white hair that I've seen. Ichigo thought aloud. Same could be said about orange hair too YA no. Elfman pointed out jokingly. Anyway, how do you like being a member of the guild so far? Levi inquired, smiling brightly as she spoke. I like it a lot actually. It gets a bit too loud for my taste sometimes, but I can manage. Ichigo replied. Yeah, I can get that. I'm really not one to rush into a fight, I'd much rather prefer to read a good book. Levi replied bashfully. Oh, you like to read? Maybe you should introduce yourself to Lucy, she seemed to like books a hell of a lot from what I could tell. Ichigo suggested. Actually Natsu already introduced us. I think it's really cool that she's writing her own novel, and I sort of made her promise to let me read it when it's done. Levi replied. Really? Ichigo trailed off, giving a glance towards the pink-haired dragon slayer. Hey, I'm introducing you now, aren't I? Natsu countered. So tell us about yourself. If you got the master to believe you weren't really from this dimension, I'm just dying to know where you come from and what it looks like. Levi said excitedly. Not much I can really say about what it looks like since nothing can really compare to seeing it in person, but if you're asking about me personally, I'd say I. Ichigo began. Oh there's no need for you to be so boring about introducing yourself Ichigo. Here, let me help you out a bit. Kana chirped as she took a seat down at the table next to the white-haired man. Hey Kana, did the two of you already meet? Levi asked curiously. Yep, but I didn't really get a chance to ask him anything. Right now though I want to play a bit of a game that might give us some insight as to what's underneath that skull of his, figuratively speaking, I've already seen most of the good stuff, after all. Kana stated, giggling at the recollection of the orange-haired teen's picture. Oh my. Levi muttered, a blush coming to her face. She knew perfectly well about the picture, but even so that was only one of the two meanings behind the avid drinker's words. Will you cut it out already? Ichigo exclaimed in an annoyed fashion, a blush clearly coming onto his cheeks. Easy there pretty boy, I was just kidding. Anyway, aren't you at all interested in what I meant by what I said? Kana asked. Would it surprise you if I said no? Ichigo growled out, not entirely trusting the brown-haired wizard given what he knew about her personality thus far. Now that hurts me a little bit, but I guess I had that coming. Anyway, the type of magic I use is card magic, and one of its uses is revealing someone's personality through something similar to fortune-telling. However this is a thousand times more accurate than those cheap hacks. Kana stated. Come on Ichigo, it sounds like it'd be fun. Natsu said cheerfully patting his friend on the back in a childish manner. Guess it couldn't hurt. Ichigo thought aloud before taking a seat. The brown-haired woman then shuffled a series of cards in a very experienced manner, doing several difficult tricks, as she gracefully prepared the deck. Everyone else sat in place looking at the events, and even a few that weren't present zoned in on the game with their ears so as to listen in on the conversation. Kana's fortune cards were actually quite accurate when reading people, and even though most people never bothered to use them since it would likely end badly for them, this was a rare instance in which the booze enthusiast was likely to hold back on any tricks. This was clearly only put to rest in favor of actually getting some semblance of information about the orange-haired teen's personality. All right then, are you ready to start? Kana asked, smirking as she set the deck down on the surface of the wooden table. As I'll ever be. Ichigo replied blankly. A series of four columns each holding three cards was placed directly in front of him a moment later, after which the remainder of the cards were placed directly to the brunette's right, obviously no longer holding any use for the purposes of her little trick. Now this one's a pretty easy game. Just point to a card in one of these columns and I will flip it. The cards themselves are actually blank so no matter which you pick the result will likely be the same. Kana stated. Then why the hell did you put out so many in the first place? Ichigo asked in an annoyed tone. To show off of course. Kana replied, smirking devilishly as she did so. Fine. Ichigo said. 
A moment later he gestured his finger towards a card in the first row, most of those nearby paying very close attention to what was about to occur. Whether it was out of curiosity or boredom, a fair amount of people had made their way over. Lucy, Urza, as well as Grey had come up behind Natsu to get a better vantage point, and even Myra Jane had opted to serve in the area around the table the events were occurring on. Then the first card is. Kana began, after which she made to flip the playing card. When the object was finally turned over it revealed the image of a knight in shining armor. He rode no horse and bore no lance, but instead simply stood in the ground and carried a pitch-black sword. That, however, wasn't the most noticeable aspect of the magical card. Behind the knight stood two women, one clad in white with long orange hair, and one clad in black with raven hair as dark as night. Ichigo's eyes actually widened as the direct similarities to what he had done a little over a year ago weren't lost to him by any means. Well, well, what do we have here? Looks like a knight in shining armor looking after a few damsels in distress. From what I can tell, this implies you're a protector by definition, someone who'll risk his life to save those precious to him. I'd also say by the two women in this card that you're a bit of a playboy. Kane amused, giving the teen a teasing smirk as she did so. That last part is completely wrong, but yes, I'd say that about sums up my reasons for fighting. When I got my powers it was never for my own personal gain, and I've never seen them as tools that I use for myself even after I got stronger. The way I saw it, if I couldn't protect the people I cared about then they weren't useful at all. Ichigo replied, a light blush on his face at the teased implication of the card magic user. Why does that not surprise me? Natsu, Urza, and Myra thought similarly. Hey, somehow I knew I had you pegged right from the start my boy. Makarov thought with a smile, having heard the teen's declaration from a nearby table. He may be the guild's master, but even he was curious as to what the cards would reveal, so to speak. I see, so not a playboy then. Kana teased. Will you just drop it? Ichigo growled out. Okay, okay, go ahead and pick another card then. Kana requested. Shortly thereafter yet another card was pointed to, after which it was flipped over once again. This time, however, the card was far more symbolic of actions than personality. It was the image of a man holding the world over his shoulders, clear-cut and to the point. So you're someone who is willing to hold up the world all by himself if he needs to, always looking out for others and never himself despite what you must give up to do so. Kana stated. I can't deny that one. Ichigo admitted uncaringly. It was actually a bit funny to him that this particular card happened to come up. Just one year ago, he recalled a series of events that gave off that exact impression. I'm seeing a trend here. You're someone who protects and doesn't care what he loses in order to do so, that combination is as dangerous as it is noble and charming. Kana said jokingly. Natsu and Urza smiled, one more reserved than the other, but still each was smiling nonetheless. The entire definition of their existence was to look out for their guild mates, despite whatever idiotic actions they decided to take. Every single one of them was their family, and family wasn't something you ever turned your back on. However, these thoughts were not the consensus among those who had heard. Yes, it is definitely noble, but even so Kana isn't wrong. With an attitude like that it makes me wonder how he can ever really be happy. Myra thought. It was actually quite saddening, looking out for everyone else while having the most fantastic abilities. However, Myra couldn't quite decide what aspect of it was more saddening, the fact that it led to Ichigo's own potential lack of joy, or the fact that she wished more than anything that she had been capable of seeing the world like that before losing her powers. Perhaps if she had been less focused on her own abilities and growth as a wizard, she would still be able to hold one of the people she treasured most. That one right there. Ichigo said, breaking everyone present out of their thoughts. The brown-haired wizard nodded as a sign that she had heard him loud and clear, after which she flipped the playing card, revealing something that caused several to sweat drop at the sight of it. The image was just a decimated structure coated in flames with the black silhouette of a man standing over its apparent remains. Okay. I think this one's pretty straightforward. You've got a talent for destroying things and fighting in general. Kana stated. That's an understatement. Makarov exclaimed before downing another drink. Will you just forget about that already? Ichigo shouted angrily, turning to face the elderly wizard with a tick mark popping out of his forehead. Several chuckled at this, but sadly the master wasn't one of them. It happened yesterday night, how am I supposed to drop it this quickly? Makarov countered, an alcohol-induced blush present on his cheeks. Anyway. Kana muttered, 
bringing the orange-haired teen's attention back to the table. Oh right, sorry about that, that one right there. Ichigo said, tapping one of the cards in the final row. Kana nodded a moment later, after which she flipped the magic card like she had with each previous, however this time was substantially different. It was the image of a man staring directly out of the card, which wasn't all that strange, but then again that wasn't the most glaring aspect of the picture. Behind the man stood what appeared to be a pitch black shadow, though it wasn't that of the man's. It was the image of a being similar in form to a demon that possessed golden eyes, claws, and a set of horn protruding forwards out of its head. What is that? Many wondered, having never seen this card actually come out of the fortune teller's deck before. The inner demon, you've got a temper then, huh? Kana asked jokingly in an attempt to defuse the situation. She really didn't have any idea behind the card's meaning outside of this guess. For some reason her magic couldn't read the actual meaning, which had never truly happened before. The booze enthusiast had personally hoped very much so that this was the case, however the reaction she got from Fairy Tale's latest member told her that such hopes were easily shattered. The slight pained expression was something she caught a glimpse of for only a moment, and she may very well have been the only one to see it, but still she did. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Kana thought, releasing an inward sigh. Yeah, that must be it. Ichigo replied calmly. Those who stood around them were either lost in thought, confused, or had no idea what was going on. Despite the difference in inward feelings and thoughts, one thing remained constant, and that was the awkward silence that ensued upon the card being revealed. Okay, well, that was fun and all, but I think we are done. How about I get you a drink for being a good sport? Kana offered, successfully diffusing the situation. No thanks, I haven't ever really had alcohol before, so I... Ichigo began. Whoa. You're telling me that you've never had a drink before. Myra, get him a drink right now. Kana exclaimed, sounding genuinely panicked. It seemed she truly did take alcohol seriously no matter the situation. No thanks, drinking isn't really my thing to begin with. Ichigo said sternly. The hell it isn't. Myra, do whatever you did to get him in the picture and get him to take a drink. Kana requested, her tone sounding serious. I wouldn't mind seeing him with his shirt off in person. A female yelled out. Ichigo immediately whipped around, a blush evident on his face, in an effort to see whoever it was that made that comment. This, in turn, caused several near him to laugh, but everyone seemed to miss the ever-so-slight scowl that made its way onto the barmaid's face upon hearing that comment being randomly yelled out by one of the guild's female wizards. Come on Ichigo, one drink. Kana said, holding up a fresh mug to the substitute's face. The orange-haired teen turned around once more, directing his sights towards the mug that was just within his reach. He knew full well that the brown-haired wizard wasn't going to let this go anytime soon, especially if her orientation towards binge drinking was anything to go by. With that in mind, he released a heavy sigh of annoyance and slumped his shoulders momentarily, after which he chose to speak once more. Fine, one drink, that's it. Ichigo said sternly, taking the mug in his hands. Of course, just one drink. Kana replied, hiding the smirk that came onto her lips with the mug that she herself drank from. Chapter 13 Come on, Ichigo, one drink. Kana said, holding up a fresh mug to the substitute's face. The orange-haired teen turned around once more, directing his sights towards the mug that was just within his reach. He knew full well that the brown-haired wizard wasn't going to let this go anytime soon, especially if her orientation towards binge drinking was anything to go by. With that in mind, he released a heavy sigh of annoyance and slumped his shoulders momentarily, after which he chose to speak once more. Fine, one drink, that's it. Ichigo said sternly, taking the mug in his hands. Of course, just one drink. Kana replied, hiding the smirk that came onto her lips with the mug that she herself drank from. Fairy Tale Guild Hall, the next morning. The resident substitute Soul Reaper currently enjoyed the oh so refreshing feeling of waking up with his eyes still closed. He instantly noticed several things, each of which didn't really give him a pleasant disposition at the moment. Firstly, he could feel the hard wood floors of the guild hall underneath his back, which told him exactly where he had slept. Secondly, he couldn't really remember fully the events of the previous night. At the moment it was just bits and pieces, and this told him what exactly caused him to end up in this situation. I said one damn drink. Ichigo thought in an annoyed fashion, releasing a groan of mild frustration. Arg, my neck. Ichigo uttered, picking his upper body up from the floor of the guild hall. He looked around and saw numerous other people passed out, 
some of whom he had recognized from the previous night. However, he took distinct notice that many were currently not present, mainly Natsu, Lucy, Gray, as well as several of those he had met the previous night. Myra Jane, however, was currently sleeping with her upper body laid out on the main bar while her younger brother lay passed out on one of the tables. The master himself was currently snoring from his position atop the railing of the second floor. Wait, why is my leg warm? Ichigo wondered. The feeling of warmth hadn't entirely registered to him at first, mostly because his mind was otherwise preoccupied, but the second after he did it confused him beyond belief. What was even more concerning was the fact that he heard a quiet, feminine groaning sound from his leg. With widened eyes, he looked down to see the form of none other than the queen of the fairies holding onto his foot as if it was a body pillow. She had a peaceful smile on her face and looked like she was sleeping soundly. Why the hell is she hugging my leg? Ichigo thought, blushing slightly since, to him at least, it was an embarrassing situation. MMMM, strawberry, cheesecake. Urza mumbled sleepily. It doesn't mean strawberry, damn it. Ichigo shouted, not at all caring if the redhead would be awakened as a result. Somewhat to his surprise, Urza's reaction was really rather tame. Her eyes widened out of surprise as if she had been startled, but she didn't jump or yelp in the slightest. Upon waking she turned to look up towards Ichigo, obviously not taking note of her own position for the moment. You shouted, did something happen? Urza asked in her usual robotic tone of voice. Yeah, I woke up to see you hugging my leg and mumbling something about strawberry cheesecake. So I will repeat this for the last time. My name doesn't mean strawberry, it means he who protects. Ichigo said as calmly as he was able, though he sincerely doubted this would be the last time he had to say that. The scarlet-haired woman looked at him confusedly for a split second, after which she took notice of what she was currently going. Almost immediately she released her hold on his leg, a slight blush covering her cheeks out of embarrassment for what she had unconsciously done. In an effort to apologize, she got up from her position on the ground and directed a deep bow towards the orange-haired teen. I see, then please allow me to apologize for my actions. You may stree. Urza began, only to be cut off. Forget about it, it's not a big deal. Ichigo said, after which he himself got up from the floor and cracked his neck. Very well, then I should take my leave now. Urza replied before coming up from the bow. A moment later she turned her back towards the substitute and made to leave the guild hall, an action that drastically confused the only other person who happened to be awake alongside her. Where are you going? Ichigo asked confusedly. Urza turned to look at him with a raised brow, clearly not understanding the confusion that the orange-haired Soul Reaper was exhibiting. Perhaps his lack of memory on what was about to occur was a result of spending too much time with a certain dragon slayer. My fight with Natsu is about to begin shortly. We agreed on the time last night during all of the commotion. You were there when it happened therefore I am confused as to why you seem to have forgotten. Urza explained. Yeah. I think I remember that happening. Ichigo thought aloud. Regardless, I am on my way towards the chosen location. You are welcome to accompany me if you wish. Urza offered in a friendly manner. Sure. Ichigo simply replied, knowing full well that he didn't have anything better to do at the moment. On top of that he did need to find Natsu since the Dragon Slayer had left him at the Guildhall that night, and there was no point in going anywhere else if he already knew where he'd be. Streets of Magnolia The city was currently buzzing with activity despite the fact that it was somewhat early in the morning. People were out shopping, children were already running around in what seemed to be a random manner, and even a few people were just taking a walk in the early morning sun. Is it really true that you are from another dimension, as the others have said? Urza questioned abruptly. Thus far the two had walked in silence, though it wasn't exactly comfortable given that very clearly the scarlet-haired mage wanted to say something but was hesitating. It was actually a source of comfort to Ichigo that she had chosen to speak up otherwise the awkward silence would have just continued for the remainder of the distance they needed to travel. Yes, that's the truth. Out of curiosity, what did they say exactly? Ichigo asked. Lucy informed me that you were somehow sucked into this world by the means of something called a restrictive current, if my memory serves me well. She also informed me that the master believes you are telling the truth, and that is all I honestly need to hear for me to believe you. Urza replied. Really? Ichigo exclaimed, sounding confused. Well, I do have questions regarding the topic, but they can wait. Urza mused. Why not just ask them now? We've got some time until we get to where you're fighting Natsu, so you may as well. 
Ichigo reasoned. Very well, then I would like to ask if there is something similar to magic from where you come from. You give off an aura of energy whenever you fight, but it isn't like any type of magical energy I've felt before. Urza said. To answer your question, no, at least, not really. From where I come from there is something similar to magic energy, but normal people don't really have it like they do in this world. Ichigo replied. I see. That explains why you were able to power the magic mobile. That is very interesting, but still it leaves me wondering how exactly your powers fit in if most do not have them. Urza stated. There are two realms of existence where I come from, well, technically three that I've been to at least. The first of these worlds is called the Soul Society, and that is where the concept of spiritual energy comes from. When people pass away, they go to this place in what is called a soul form. Every human has a soul, and when they die their soul is released. When that happens they become invisible to normal people because they are at a higher level of existence, and while they can still interact with normal humans, they cannot be seen or heard. Ichigo began. Then this soul form is what you take on when you use your powers. Urza reasoned. Yes. The other major world that exists is called the world of the living, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It is full of normal people that can't interact with the spiritual world. Normally most souls instantly travel to the soul society after death, but when they do not it becomes an issue for obvious reasons. When that happens, that's where soul reapers come into play. Those that have enough spiritual energy become soul reapers and their jobs are to primarily transport wayward souls to the soul society so that they don't mess up the world of the living. Ichigo continued. I could assume that a wayward soul, as you say, would be an issue. Urza thought aloud. Yeah, but they usually don't cause too many problems. The biggest worry is if their soul becomes corrupted and they turn into hollow soul reapers, are also responsible for purifying hollows and preventing them from attacking normal people. Ichigo stated. What exactly is a hollow? Is it like a demon? Urza asked, the concept sounding somewhat similar. In a way, yes. They live in a world called Hueco Mundo, and they feed on souls to both keep themselves alive and gain more power. They make their way to the world of the living and usually cause a lot of problems, but thankfully the strongest ones evolve so that they no longer need to consume souls to live, and as a result they usually stay quiet. Ichigo explained. That's convenient. However I am still confused about one thing. Where exactly do you lie in all of this? Urza asked. Thus far she had been told many, many things that only serve us to increase her curiosity about what his world was like. She did follow everything that was said, but she still didn't completely understand. The concept of souls was fascinating in and of itself, but the dynamic of how absolutely complicated the system seemed to be was mind-boggling. Again, that's kind of complicated. You see, I was born with dormant soul reaper powers because my dad was a soul reaper, and my mother was human. After awakening my powers I became something called a substitute soul reaper, which is basically just a title for someone who has the duties of a soul reaper, but still gets to live as a normal human being. On top of that, I don't report directly to the soul society itself, nor do I have to live there. Ichigo explained. Interesting, but since you are halfway between these two realms of existence, have you ever desired to be nothing more than a normal human? Urza asked. A moment later the orange-haired teen stopped dead in his tracks, which took a moment to register with his companion. The Requip user then turned to see a slightly pained expression on Ichigo's face, something that instantly caused her to inwardly panic. I hope my question didn't cross some sort of line. Urza thought, choosing to stay silent given that she didn't want to say anything to make matters worse. To her, at least, the question didn't really seem like it was too personal or daring, but that really wasn't for her to decide given that she wasn't the one answering it. A moment later her worries were put to the back of her mind in favor of breaking her guild mate out of his trance. Ichigo. Urza called out warily. What? Oh, sorry about that. Your question just kind of took me by surprise. Ichigo began, rubbing the back of his head and dawning a small smile. This caused Urza to release an inward sigh of relief. Given that she hadn't really known him for too long, she was worried that asking each question she desired would come across as rude or intrusive and subsequently bother him. Luckily that didn't seem to be the case. To be honest though, I had at one point thought that it would be all right, even better in some regards, if I had lost my spirit energy and by extension my powers, but now I know that these abilities, this power that I have, they give me the ability to protect, to fight for what I value above all else. That isn't something I would trade for the world, figuratively speaking. 
Ichigo finally replied. There was already an established precedent after the incident with Aizen that he would, in fact, sacrifice his powers to save the world, or worlds in his case. I see, then I suppose we are much the same way. I value my powers since they allow me to protect Fairy Tail, and that is why I never stop trying to grow stronger, so that I can continue to fight against the enemies of our guild. Urza stated. I figured that's the type of person you were. Ichigo thought aloud. Pardon? Urza asked, not hearing quite what was just said. Nothing, I was just thinking out loud. Ichigo replied, shrugging off his words given that he didn't think they really mattered. Still, the way that he gave his answer to my last question, it makes me believe that he speaks from experience. Perhaps that is why my question disturbed him. Urza thought. It made sense that bringing up memories of his powerless days would cause his mood to dampen, but despite the fact that this was still only her opinion she was in no way going to press even further on the issue. One day maybe she'd find out, but speculation would suffice for now. So do you have family back in your world? Urza asked, deciding to change the subject, but still keep the conversation going. Yeah, I do. I've got two younger sisters that re both around the same age. Then there's my dad, he's a pain in the ass, but I wouldn't change anything about him. Ichigo replied, smiling warmly at the memory of his family. Perhaps they may have been separated for the moment, but that didn't change the fact that just thinking of them brought him a small sense of joy. You said that your father was a soul reaper, does that mean that your sisters manifest similar abilities just as you do? Urza asked, noticing that the topic of his family seemed to lighten him up a bit. Realistically she was just trying to find out as much as she possibly could, given that this person was just by definition an enigma. How he acted, the abilities he had displayed, and yet at the same time he literally wasn't from this world. She'd be abnormal if she wasn't constantly intrigued by his actions and personality. My sisters are spiritually aware, at least I think they are. One of them definitely is, and the younger of the two is somewhat aware, but still cannot see spirits just yet, however that could change in the future. My dad still actually has his powers, but to tell you the truth how he got to where he is now isn't a story I've asked him to tell. Ichigo replied. The conversation seemed to be going good, however Urza's desire to continue it conflicted with her desire not to ask any questions that would put Ichigo in a foul mood an instant later. And what about your mother? Urza asked, giving a sideways glance towards the orange-haired teen. The scarlet-haired wizard almost winced at the pained look in his eyes and a genuine frown of sorrow marking his face. She had seen that look only a few times in her life, and not once had she ever been glad to see it, nor had it ever been a sign of good news to come. At the very least he didn't stop in his tracks this time, which didn't really make sense to her, but in truth it didn't really matter. I can't believe I did this again. Urza thought, mentally berating herself. She knew full well that Ichigo didn't mention his mother in any previous instance, which clearly meant that he wasn't mentioning her because he had a reason. The worst of these scenarios was if she had passed away, and the red-headed knight hoped very much so that this wasn't the case. She passed away when I was nine years old. Ichigo finally replied, causing his traveling companion to inwardly swear at his words. I am sorry that I asked such a thoughtless question. You may hit me for my penance if you wish. Urza offered, stopping in place and turning to face the substitute. Her words, however, caused said teen to release a tired sigh. Why is it that every time you think you do something wrong you ask to be hit? Ichigo wondered aloud. It is my way of reprimanding myself for unsuitable behavior. However no one seems to ever contemplate doing so. Urza replied, ending in a confused tone. She actually couldn't quite recall a time when someone took her up on her offer to be struck. Who the hell would? Ichigo asked rhetorically. The two walked in silence for a few minutes, though it was far less awkward than prior. Even so, Urza still desired to continue. Speaking with Fairy Tail's latest member, if only so that they may get to know each other a little better given that they worked so well alongside Natsu, Grey, and Lucy on their previous mission. Is there anything you would like to ask me? I realize that you may have a few questions of your own. Urza stated. Maybe later, right now I think we are coming up on the fighting area. Ichigo pointed out. A large crowd was gathering in a somewhat circular formation, at the center of which appeared to be none other than Natsu himself, who awaited the coming battle with an eager grin. Everyone seemed rather lively, and with that in mind Urza wasted no time getting through the masses so that she could address her opponent and prepare for the fight. Ichigo, however, opted to head to the forefront of the crowd, catching a glimpse of very much so blonde hair and a raven-haired man without a shirt. 
The combination of the two didn't really leave much thinking to do before he was able to discern who they were. Hey guys. Ichigo greeted as he walked up to the two wizards. Hey Ichigo, glad you could make it. I was a little worried you wouldn't show up after how much you had to drink last night. Gray stated in a friendly manner. Speaking of not showing up, where the hell are your clothes? Ichigo asked in an agitated fashion. That's exactly what I said when he showed up in my house. Lucy growled out. I already told you, I was naked when I got there. Gray replied. Is that supposed to make it better? Ichigo asked rhetorically. Anyway, Gray got me to come to this fight since he thought I would forget. To be honest I was a bit surprised to see that they were going through with it. Lucy said. If they value their manhood then they'd better go through with it. Elfman commented from a nearby position. The three turned to look at their left to see the two Strauss siblings, as well as Macau standing front and center to get a good view of the fight. That, however, confused Ichigo a good bit given that he had seen the three of them passed out just a short time ago. Urs is not a man. Myra pointed out blankly. Yeah, but why I gotta admit she's pretty manly. Macau said jokingly, though his words rung true. How did the three of you get here? Ichigo trailed off confusedly. I am pretty sure they walked. Gray stated, prompting the orange-haired teen to glare at him. I meant how they got here before me and Urza. You three were passed out when we left. Ichigo clarified, taking away his glare from the ice make user as he did so. Maybe the two of you took the longer route. Natsu came into the guild hall and woke everyone up a little while ago. Myra replied. Back to this fight though, aren't you worried it would tear apart Fairy Tail's strongest team? Lucy asked with slight concern in her voice. Strongest team, what are you talking about? Gray asked amusedly. You, Natsu, and Urza are Fairy Tail's strongest wizards, right? Lucy replied. Technically Ichigo wasn't one, but even so she knew him to be incredibly powerful. What idiot fed you that lie? Gray scoffed. An instant later the white-haired barmaid began to cry as a result of being thoroughly insulted. At this, Ichigo just glared at the raven-haired teen who currently held his hands up in an attempt to calm the wailing female. I didn't mean it like that Myra. Gray said, though his words failed to calm her down as he had hoped. Natsu and Gray are tough, I'll give them that, but they're not even close to being the strongest. There are wizards in fairy tale that are stronger than the two of them combined. Elfman stated matter-of-factly. Still it's a pretty safe bet that Urza's the strongest female wizard in fairy tale. Levi commented as she along with her teammates decided to butt in on the conversation. Yeah, but if we're talking about the strongest male I'd say it's Laxus or Mistigen. Elfman commented. Still, I'm interested to see how this fight turns out. Lucy stated, directing her vision back towards the fight. Nothing had happened as of yet, both of the two wizards just seemed to be staring each other down. I bet she'll mop the floor with him. Gray said, smirking at the prospect. Natsu may have been stronger than most, even if he would personally never say so, but his opponent was a practical monster and simply on a different level. Don't count Natsu out. They are both strong from what I can tell and anything can happen in a fight. All it takes is one slip up and all of a sudden Natsu could end up landing a good hit or two. Ichigo stated. True, but Urza is still a heck of a wizard. Myra commented. Their conversation was interrupted at the sight of a large flash of light engulfing Urza's body. It seemed that she was about to dawn one of her various armors, though which it would be was difficult to tell. When the transformation finally came full circle, her new appearance was revealed. It was made up of gauntlets that resembled dragon's limbs and a breastplate and greaves, leaving her shoulders as well as her upper arms and thighs exposed. The armor itself was predominantly red, but sported several orange and black parts that took on a shape similar to flames. Her hair also became tied in two separate, long pigtails that whose clips gave off the appearance of obsidian dragon horns. Finally, a sword made itself present in her right hand, having a crimson blade and appearing as if the steel was trying to manifest fire itself. That's Flame Empress armor. Macau stated. Or, come on Urza, at least give the kid a chance. Wakaba stated. Flame Empress armor. Ichigo wondered aloud. It's a special type of armor that reduces the effectiveness of fire-based attacks by roughly 50%. Against someone like Natsu it's the perfect weapon. Myra stated. TCH, that's not so bad. Actually it's good news for me, cause now I can turn up the heat as much as I want. 
Natsu exclaimed happily, lighting his fists up with flames. Round one, start. Makarov permitted, though once again the substitute had no idea where he came from. Natsu charged Urza the instant after the match had started, bringing his fist back and preparing to strike first regardless of what his opponent would try to do in response. The two hadn't fought in some time, and now was his time to prove how much stronger he had gotten. The scarlet-haired mage dodged the attack, after which she brought her sword swinging across the midsection of the dragon slayer. He, in turn, flipped his body before willing fire to form around his foot and cutting said foot across his opponent's head in an attempt to take advantage of his position. Not bad. Ichigo thought, observing Natsu's choice of counterattacks. Each of the warriors continued to fight against one another, engaging each other several times in much the same pattern. One of them would mount an attack, after which the other would expertly dodge, while simultaneously preparing to mount a counteroffensive. The aggressor was traditionally Natsu, but Urza was always a step ahead and blocked the counterattack before the fight would come to a momentary standstill, after which Natsu would once again charge in or opt to use his fire dragon's roar, after which his opponent would dodge again and continuously rinse and repeat. See, it's a good fight, eh? Elfman mused. This fight sucks. Grey griped, obviously due to the fact that the dragon slayer had yet to get his ass handed to him. Natsu leaped towards his opponent yet again, opting to deliver a punch to her abdomen in an effort to circumvent the armor's effects. He didn't necessarily believe it would work, but nevertheless his offensive would allow him to force his fellow wizard to take action, which he could potentially take advantage of. Urza, on the other hand, stood her ground and was preparing to meet the attack head-on. The abrupt sounding of a gong, however, caused everyone present to freeze up, even the two combatants. A moment later a rather feminine voice called out, at first confusing those who had heard it. This fight is over. An amphibious individual stated matter-of-factly, as it made its way through the crowd. It was dressed in a very odd fashion, and it looked even stranger, but nevertheless it appeared to have something important to say. What the hell is that thing? Ichigo thought. It was true he had seen some very strange things in his lifetime, but never before had he seen a frog that was the size of a human with the same capabilities to speak. May I have your attention please? I have come here on behalf of the Magic Council. The apparent messenger began. This can't be good. Ichigo thought amidst the quiet panicked murmurs of the crowd. As a result of the Eisenwald incident, two of your guild's members have been requested to attend a hearing where you will be judged in accordance with the laws of the land. Urza Scarlet, you are to come with me and stand trial. The messenger stated, her words shocking everyone present. She's gonna stand what? Natsu exclaimed. The dragon slayer instantly fired up his fists and got directly in front of the scarlet-haired wizard, obviously desiring to prevent her from leaving. The essential frog person, however, was obviously in no mood to deal with such trivial matters. Stand aside, Natsu Dragniel. It requested, holding up its hand as if to prepare some sort of spell. Like hell I will. Natsu shouted defiantly. Very well. The messenger trailed off. A ball of energy formed in its hand, altering most present to what was about to happen. It didn't have the feel of a destructive attack, but even so it didn't give off the appearance of something that you'd want to be hit with. Someone catch me. Ichigo stated. An instant later he grabbed his combat pass and leaped in front of his pink-haired comrade, doing so just in time to slice what he presumed to be an attack in half and subsequently causing it to fall harmlessly to his sides. That was fast. Elfman commented. Can someone please help me with this? Lucy exclaimed, being the only one who had actually been in a position to catch the teen's body, and even then she had barely heard his words in time to act. That was a polymorphic spell you dolt, it's completely harmless. Makarov stated from the sidelines. How the hell was I supposed to know that? Ichigo shouted back in an annoyed manner. Orange hair, black clothing, a large cleaver-like sword, you must be Ichigo Kurosaki, am I correct? The woman asked politely, allowing her hand to rest at her side once more. Yeah, that's me. Ichigo replied, sheathing his sword within the white cloth and placing it on his back once more. You are the second member of your guild whose presence was requested. The both of you come with me please. She requested. Can you tell me why it is I am being arrested first? Ichigo asked, his eyes slightly narrowed as he gazed on the odd-looking amphibian's form. You are not being officially arrested. Urza Scarlet is the only one who has been criminally charged as a result of her recent actions. However you have still been requested to come in for questioning in order for the council to determine if you should share in her sentence. 
The messenger explained. You said requested, so what happens if I decide not to go? Ichigo asked. If he could avoid a meeting with the Magic Council, as well as a lengthy explanation, that may or may not cause him to wind up in jail he most certainly would. Then perhaps the original sentence on Urza Scarlet will be more severe than was originally intended. The messenger replied ominously. Ichigo scowled at this, mostly because he knew full well that this weird-looking frog thing had just successfully guaranteed he would attend the trial. It was true that he didn't want to be dragged into it, but he wouldn't take the easy way out at the expense of someone else, that just wasn't who he was. Fine, I guess I have no issues tagging along. Ichigo said, his tone one of clear annoyance. Splendid, come with me please. She requested. Hang on, let me get my body. Ichigo stated blankly. The messenger looked at him strangely, but chose to say nothing, however that was not the choice of a certain dragon slayer, who very clearly didn't want either of the two to head towards some kind of trail for something that the entire guild was likely responsible for. Hey, wait a minute, you two are actually going through with this. Natsu shouted. Calm down Natsu, this is the will of the council and we must abide. Stay here and don't do anything stupid. Urza said. But I... Natsu began, only to be cut off. Listen to Urza, Natsu. We'll be fine, and the last thing we need is this getting worse than it already is. Ichigo stated as he walked out of the crowd, once again being within his body. Are you ready then? We mustn't keep the council waiting after all. The amphibian said. Yeah, I'm ready. Ichigo replied. The three began to walk off, everyone else staying silent as they did so. Very clearly they all wanted to say something, but at the same time no one wanted to make anything worse. Even Natsu kept quiet as they headed off for what he thought to be the worst. You didn't have to do that for my sake. I would have been perfectly fine regardless of what your choice was. Urza stated abruptly, sounding somewhat annoyed that someone else had been brought into this when it could have technically been avoided. It wasn't that she wasn't grateful, but even so she preferred to be the one making sacrifices for others, not the other way around. If I didn't go then it'd just create more trouble, so at least this way I'm creating less of it for the both of us. Ichigo replied. I see, then you have my thanks. Hopefully this won't be entirely terrible. Urza said. That makes two of us. Ichigo commented seriously. Train heading towards the trial location, some time later. The council's messenger had opted to leave the two fairy tale members alone in their own booth in favor of allowing them some space. In actuality it likely had something to do with the fact that a certain orange-haired individual had openly threatened her for attempting to put handcuffs on Urza Scarlet. The boy certainly could be intimidating when he wanted to be and the amphibious individual had certainly learned that the hard way. Currently, however, the two sat in silence, though it was comfortable. Each just looked out the window, gazing into the luscious forests that marked the path towards what was likely a trail with ulterior motives. You know, if you have any questions that you wish to ask me, now would be a good time. Urza pointed out, breaking the silence that had erupted since the time the substitute had threatened the envoy. I am pretty bored, so I guess now's as good a time as any. Ichigo reasoned, though his words were not very well received. I'm so glad that speaking to me is a good alternative to being bored. Urza said sarcastically, causing the orange-haired teen's eyes to widen given that he definitely didn't mean to offend his guild mate with his words. I didn't mean it like that at all. Ichigo stated in an attempt to assure the red-headed wizard that this was the case. Urza just huffed in response, after which she turned to look out the window once more, her hands crossed underneath her breasts, or at least a location where the armor covered them. Clearly she was offended in some way. Sorry, you may strike me down if you wish. Ichigo said sarcastically, if not mockingly. The substitute sorely regretted doing so a moment later due to the fact that his words weren't taken, as they were intended. Almost immediately after he finished his sentence an armored hand smacked him across his face, causing his cheek to go red, as a result. He brought his hand up to cover the cheek, somewhat confused as to how or why this could happen, but he understood upon looking back at Urza and seeing her mood had once again returned to normal. What the hell was that for? Ichigo exclaimed, rubbing the cheek as he did so. His words, however, elicited a confused look from the red-headed knight, who very clearly didn't understand the outburst. Said wizard blinked several times in succession, after which she spoke. You asked me to. Urza replied, as if the answer was far too obvious. Ichigo opened his mouth to respond, but the words died in his throat the second after he considered the words of his comrade. He couldn't exactly say that wasn't true, 
and getting into an argument over sarcasm was just a waste of time at this point. Fair enough. Ichigo trailed off. I accept your apology and permit you to ask whatever questions you may have. Urza stated. H.M. I guess I'd have to ask you this first. What's it like being the strongest female in fairy tale? Ichigo asked. The substitute's question seemed to catch Urza off guard slightly, though he couldn't really tell why that was the case. Perhaps she was confused as to what he meant, or maybe she just never expected him to ask such a thing. I mean, everyone says that you're the strongest female by far. That kind of title has to come with some kind of pressure. Hell, I'd even go so far as to say that you're the one taking the fallout for damage done by me, Natsu, Grey, and the rest of our guild mates. Ichigo added. After he had said this, Urza released a slight chuckle. Ichigo raised a brow at this, not entirely sure what would inspire humor out of what he had just said, and what's more the red-headed knight was giving him a small smile. What? Ichigo asked confusedly. Oh nothing, just that a moment ago you said our guild mates. Urza replied. I guess I did, didn't I? Ichigo mused, releasing a slight chuckle and smiling himself. I am rather glad that you seem to be at home in fairy tale. Even if we cannot replace your family, we are all happy to be there for you. Urza stated. Yeah, I'm glad I found a place like fairy tale. If enough time passes it might get too difficult to choose whether or not I should stay. Ichigo replied, ending on a slightly joking tone. In truth he just deeply hoped that it wouldn't come down to that, but not addressing such a depressing thought was what he perceived as the best course of action for the moment. Yes, well to answer your previous question, I do not feel pressure from holding the title of strongest female. I find my role as the guild's guardian and role model far more stressful if I am being perfectly honest. It falls to me to bring peace and order to our family. Urza said. I admire the fact that you take on that responsibility, not many people would be able to do that. I think even I'd struggle with something like that, and you make it look easy. Ichigo stated honestly. The scarlet-haired female blushed slightly at the compliment, mostly due to the fact that no one had ever really bothered to admire the fact that she intentionally acted the way she did. Actually most of her guild mates likely didn't realize that she was so strict and professional for their sakes. It was just nice for another person to acknowledge the effort she had put in. Thank you. Urza replied, averting her eyes for a moment. Don't mention it. Ichigo said in a friendly manner. What about yourself? Were you bearing a similar burden in your world? Urza questioned. She recalled the previous night, when Kana had unveiled the image of a man carrying the weight of the world across his shoulders. That, coupled with what he had just said, told her that, perhaps, the orange-haired teen spoke from personal experience. I guess you could say that. I've felt the pressure of having everyone depending on me, but that just drives me to fight no matter what the cost. In fact, I've had that feeling more than once but I'd rather not talk about that right now, especially since. I doubt you'd believe me. Ichigo replied, chuckling slightly as he finished. He was under the impression that even by this world's standards some of the things he had done would seem impossible. Oh, then perhaps another time. Urza mused, sounding ever so slightly disappointed. The red-headed fairy tale wizard did, in truth, want to hear about his experiences. However he very clearly didn't feel like talking about these instances therefore she would respect his wishes despite her own desires. A comfortable silence erupted between the two once again, neither saying a word. Each once again looked out the window nearest to their booth, gazing at the woods that seemed to go on forever and ever. Ichigo. Urza called out, being the first to speak in quite some time. Yeah, what is it? Ichigo asked evenly. I gather that you are strong, am I right? Urza reasoned eliciting a nod from the orange-haired teen. Where is she going with this? Ichigo wondered curiously. It wasn't every day that someone started off a conversation with asking if he was strong or not. If it isn't an inconvenience, would it be possible for the two of us to have a match against one another? Urza asked in a slightly bashful tone. Is there a reason that you're asking me this now? Ichigo questioned, not entirely understanding the timing. Simply because they weren't doing anything at the moment didn't necessarily dictate that any topic of conversation would come up. I merely wish to see your powers displayed against a worthy opponent. Urza replied. Perhaps it appeared a bit arrogant, but with the title of fairy tale's strongest female she did have the right to refer to herself as such. Oh, so you want me to fight Natsu? Ichigo asked with a smirk, eliciting a low but audible growl from the scarlet-haired woman. 
You dare insinuate that I am an unworthy opponent. Urza questioned in a tone that possessed a clear edge, though her words prompted the substitute to chuckle. What the hell are you laughing about? Urza asked dangerously, though her cheeks were slightly red due to a mild sense of embarrassment. Here she was trying to look threatening, and he was openly laughing. Fairy tales Titania did not have a very large ego, but she did have a great deal of pride and was not the type of person who enjoyed having her fighting abilities, which she had worked tirelessly to perfect, insulted. I was just kidding, of course I'll spar with you. All you have to do is name the time and place. Ichigo stated. The look that the red-headed wizard was giving him told him instantly that his attempt at humor was once again not well received. This time, however, she was directly glaring at him, her arms once again crossed under her breasts. I said I was just kidding. Ichigo repeated. At this, Urza's glare just deepened and he could swear her arms hugged her body tighter from their position underneath her chest. He made a mental note that Fairy Tail's strongest female was also one who was very direct in communicating her anger or frustration. He released a tired sigh, now knowing full well that he'd have to choose his words carefully whenever he spoke to the Requip user in the future, or at least until they were better acquainted. All right, I didn't mean what I said at all. You are a great fighter and I'm sorry if what I said offended you. Ichigo said honestly. Despite the earnest nature of his words, the scarlet-haired woman just lessened her glare and raised a curious brow, as if to say she expected something else on top of his verbal apology. Ichigo, however, knew full well what that was, and thus he sighed once again, though this time out of frustration. Do you really want to hit me again? Ichigo asked. And if I do? Urza replied seriously. The orange-haired teen adopted an expression of defeat a moment later, hanging his head slightly, as if to say he was about to give in to the request of the female wizard across from him. At this, Urza prepared her hand, waiting only for the substitute to verbally confirm she had permission. However, no such thing came as Ichigo picked his head up and directed a smirk towards the redhead before making to speak. Sorry, not gonna happen. Ichigo said. You did that on purpose. Urza exclaimed childishly. Maybe I did. Ichigo replied amusedly, eliciting a huff from his scarlet-haired companion. It seemed that she could take a joke after all. 